I literally just left it when I got my coffee. I like filled it up and everything. I just left it there. All right. Um, and the lighting is back to its original setting. This one. How was it different before? I upped it by about 15 points. Okay. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yes. But now it's back because I took a picture of it. Awesome. It's at 49, right where it used to be. 49 is very specific. That's what it was at. I don't know. All right. It's back at 49. I feel, I feel like a 49, so. 49er. It's fitting. All right. Looks like we're rolling. We're rolling, but uh, are we rocking? And Not yet, but we All will right. in just a second. Well, I'm ready when you are. <clears throat> okay. Well, I'm ready when I am. Oh. <laughs> well. Okay. Welcome, everybody, to episode number 130 of the Gilead Pen Cast. Nice even number. Feels good. Um, fountain pens are still a thing here, by the way. Uh, I'm Brian Goulet. I'm Drew Brown. And we're here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show, where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we're going to be talking about gold nib pens good for writing with unposted. Very specific, but it'll make sense when we get to it. Uh, what to do with some platinum carbon black ink and which documents can or can't take fountain pen ink. Uh, what kind of digital tech is or should be incorporated into fountain pens to make them appeal to the next generation and how to write well in really, really thick journals, really thick journals, like 300 pages. Uh, we'll also be spotlighting the Shown Design Pocket 6 Bismuth, Bi oh, Bismuth Crystal, boy, is that a tongue twister, uh, with the Monarch nib. And we'll even have Ian Schoen doing a little segment talking about his Monarch nib and how the nib kind of came to be. So that'll be pretty fun. Um, it's good to be back. I was gone last week. Janaea did a great job of being herself and not being me, uh, but it's good to be back. So, yes, it is. Yeah. It's good to have you back. Awesome. Well, let's start off this week with some feedback. Ooh. All right. Giselle Smith reached out to us. Hello. And says, Drew, hi, Giselle. All the work you put into your jacket paid off. It looks fantastic. Thank you. Mm. Oh, who picked this? I don't even know. <laughs> uh, Jenea, hope to see more of you on future pen casts because this episode was so much fun with you. Oh, yeah. She'll be back. Don't you worry, no Giselle. Doubt. No doubt. Um, DM Johnson says, although Paul Rudd is immortal, he sadly was not in Clue, mm -mm. but he was in Clue less, both mm -hmm. great and classic movies. So... We had Katie visit last week, and mm -hmm. she said something about Clue. And I was like, oh, yeah, and that's where we found out Paul Rudd was immortal. And she's like, uh-huh. And then everybody was like, Drew, <laughs> Clueless, mm -hmm. Clueless. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what are they talking about? She was talking about Clueless. And then I, I'm like, no, she totally said Clue. Your mind is like filled I, in the blank. I yeah. thought for sure she said Clueless. But, yeah, of course Paul Rudd's not in Clue. My God. Yeah. But everybody was like, Drew, no, you're thinking of the other Movie with the word Clue in it. Oh my yeah. God. Clue is a great movie. It is. Yeah. The they're, they're, watched, both, they're both. I watched solid, it recently. Yeah. Clue holds up. Oh, heck yeah. Yeah. You know, Tim Curry is magnificent. Oh, yeah. Um, Patricia Clark says Drew, did you forget to hit the button for the podcast? I usually listen and watch at the same time. All right. First, Patricia, how do you listen and watch at the same time, like using the podcast versus the video? Like, because you know that the YouTube has audio <laughs> too. Has audio, right? Yeah. Um, no. Uh, I didn't. This time it was not my fault. The MP3 had not yet exported, so I couldn't upload it on time, but I uploaded it as soon as I could. So it was what, like that afternoon? It was that afternoon, yeah. So I mean, yeah, we were you a little used to bit upload late. it on Mondays, right? Like it yeah. would be like after the whole weekend. It would, but then we so, found out there was you know. that was there was no point to it. But uh <laughs> there's yeah. no reason to wait, yeah. Not my fault that time. Um <laughs> but you know. It's a lot of steps. It's there. There's a lot of steps yeah. in the publishing process. Yeah. More than yeah. you would think. But it's there now. So don't you worry. Awesome. And yeah, just enjoy continuing to listen to the podcast and watching the video at the same time. <laughs> I would say you could hear it in stereo, but I'm pretty sure we play it in stereo through YouTube. So yeah. I, don't, I don't know. Interesting. Yeah. It might be a joke as well. Maybe. Um, all right. I got some feedback too from oh. Crystal. Crawfish, crayfish, crawdads. They're all the same, but the names are regional. Good to know. There you go. Since you have, a, you know. A, a what did I call them? I think I called I think them you said crawfish, cray, 
crab. I don't even know what I called I think them. You said previously. crayfish. Crayfish? Yeah, maybe crayfish. Um, so do you still have a crayfish kingdom in your yard? Um, good question. Or have they vacated? I think that that one is not there anymore. Mm. There's plenty of others because we've had a ton of rain here recently. Yeah. So they're popping up all over the place, but all right, not well, in the middle of the yard. Anymore. So since it's your property, you get to choose what they are. Oh, it is regional, huh? What are they going to be? Um, good question. Um, can I make up something new or do I have to pick from crawfish, crayfish, or crawdads? I, I feel like you can make up something new as long as it fits in. Like it needs to start with a C and have a D in the middle of it. Have a D. Well, like, craw crawfish. I mean, crayfish. They yeah, have that's D's. true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. It needs to. It needs to kind of feel like the craw or the cray feels like like a it's like a crump crump there. funk or something like that. Oh yeah. Like or a crap a... crack cray 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 crunch or <laughs> cray flake. Um. Gosh, Cruffle, cruffle fish. Know. Crawfish, crayfish, crawdad, crawdad, the dad. I want to do something with the dad or like cray dad. Cray, cray dad would be mashing up some different things. Cray, cray dad. That's weird. I don't know what that. I, <laughs> I don't, don't know. I'm like, I'm kind of like blanking it. a little bit. I'll think about it. I don't like it. I hate it already. Do you have any suggestions of what to call these? I guess I call them crayfish. Craw dad. I don't know. Craw dad. They all work. Anyway. Um, Cal C. Prof says, I want to see a Banu Lamy collaboration making a sparkly 2000. No, uh, we did talk about collaborations last week, but mm. we didn't really get into. Pen brand plus like pen brand, brand collaborations. collaborations. It so. happens. It happens. Lamy would. I don't know that man, that would happen. Can you that, imagine that would? Lamy that just would be going, very extreme. Lamy, Lamy going full on sparkle on you know, anything. I feel like if they're going to do it, they might as well just really go for it. But yeah, I don't know because the Lamy two thousands polycarbonate, which I don't think you can do what Benu does with polycarbonate. But I don't know. That would be super interesting to see, wouldn't it? I would be very interested, but um, I don't know. We'll ask him. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Um, okay, Dave Goodridge says, I have a humbling question. If you want to laugh, please do it off camera. He's joking. I have a secret confession. I want a pink pen. I think that's cool. It's not that big a deal. Uh, I bought them as gifts, but never for myself. But I think they're beautiful. What are your feelings of a guy using a pink pen? I have many of them, I this think. The same as anybody it. using a pink pen. Yeah, I don't think it's probably as faux pas as maybe it used to be. No. I don't know. Uh, he says, I'm a sweaty mess just asking this. I just ordered for myself my first pink pen, a Platinum Plaisir. Oh. Thanks for your understanding and hearing my secret. It's a good one. That's a solid one. I like the colors of the Plaisir. A Plaisir is such an underrated pen to me. It does not get the love that it deserves. I think as people think of it as just a dressed up preppy. I used to think that, but... But it's more than that. I've, I've come around. It is more than that. I've come around to the place here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I have a couple of recommendations of some cool pink pens. Ooh. Um, the Pilot Explorer pink. It's like a bright, vibrant, like magenta kind of But it's of got pink. those cool black highlights. Yeah. Which make it look kind of like 90s, absolutely. which I dig. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, the Diplomat Aero Antique Rose. Oh, if you no. want more of like the powdery it's kind distinguished. of like, yeah, yeah. And on that pen, too, like it is a bit of more of a, I don't know, masculine shape, I guess, if you want to call it that. It's like a heavier, bulkier pen. If anybody makes fun of you for having a pink pen, you can just hit them with you it. You smack them with it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They deserve it. Um, and the Visconti Mythos Aphrodite. <gasps> That's a really cool look. And it's more of like a deeper oh, kind of a rose. I would get that pen in a second. Yeah, Drew's obviously a That's fan a of good, the Mythos. It's a good. It's a good. It's and a it's good. not like screaming out like, Hey, I'm bright pink. No, like no, it's more is. of like a marbly pink. Yeah, it's like a mauve, like a dark, like a darker. It's, it's darker beautiful. than the antique rose, not yeah. nearly as hot pink as the Explorer. But those are three options for you. They're great pens. Solid. They're great to write with. They're nice pinks, kind of a range of colors there. But yeah, I mean, just freaking do whatever makes you happy. Heck yeah, man. I would man. not worry about it at all. Not at all. You just pink ink in it too. What the heck? Whatever makes your heart happy. Um, okay, that's it for feedback this week. Let's get into some new stuff. Oh and there's a lot of it. There's lots of new stuff, y'all. There's a lot. Let's get into it. Um, I got several platinum things to talk about. So this is sort of new, sort of not, because this stuff's been around for a little bit, but we're picking it back up. Um, so we have a couple of celluloid pens. These are the true, like, nitrocelluloids. The flammable the OG. stuff. I mean, it's more flammable in its, like, manufacturing form. It's I, don't a, want, I don't want people thinking like their pen's going to explode. I'm pretty sure it says flammable in the product description. Well, okay. It is 
potentially flammable. Don't let yes. it, don't 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 hold it next to an don't open flame. To flyer, yeah. Don't do that with any exactly. of your pens. <laughs> you really should exactly like don't you you don't need to take any special precautions. But anyway, um, in case you want a flammable pen, <laughs> uh, um, this one's really cool though. The Caracusa. So we carried this pen years ago. Um, we had some stock issues and stuff, and so we didn't carry it for a while, but. We picked it back up again. Um, so it's a little over $1,000. So it's very expensive. But not only is it celluloid, but it is hand engraved and then backfilled with silver. It looks beautiful. Um, very deep engraving too. It's like when you have the Machia pens that are the chinkin, they're like very, very light indentations. These are like gouges. Like they're very deep, very kind of textured. Um, and it, I think it looks absolutely stunning. It's got a lot of depth to it as well. Um, so that one's definitely worth a look. It's blue and silver, which I love that color scheme. Um, so check that out. It's pretty cool. It's based on the 3776. So same nib and everything that you're used to on, on that model. Uh, and then there's the 3776 Cherry Blossom. So this is a pink pen, maybe for our buddy Dave here to consider. Um, it's a lighter pink pen, but it's got like a pink and white kind of a pattern. It's not like explicitly cherry blossoms like flowers, but it almost kind of looks like flower petals um, due to that um, the, te- the, the, the pattern that's on the pen. It looks really cool. Uh, 432 for that one. Again, same thing, same nib format and everything as the 3776. Um, then we have the Platinum Izumo. So this is a model that I don't think we've had a lot of these recently. Um, we had the Rodden Galaxy for a while. Yeah, that one has been the most consistent, consistent Izumo I think we've ever yeah. had. Yeah, they don't have they don't usually have the best stock of the Izumos. They're not the most popular um, platinum pens, but um, they are kind of distinctive. So they have the this kind of interesting shape to them. They're larger than 3776, uh, and they have a larger nib as well. They've got a better nib. Drew loves that nib. It's the Platinum President El nib. El Presidente. Very like Art Deco design on that nib. Looks really cool. Uh, so it is kind of neat uh, to, to see that. So the Izumos, these are 796, so they're up there a little bit. Um, but we've got some Akatame, which is black and red. We got the Biwatame, which is black and beige, and Soratame, which is black and green. I think that's a great price. For what it is, For yeah. an Arushi pen? Yeah. With gold nib? I think it's very like fair. A yeah. larger? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, you compare that to other Arushi pens in that size? Mm-hmm. Solid. Yeah. I mean, you're looking at, like, you know, intro-level Machia from Namiki at that price. Yeah. But you're getting a bigger pen. Yeah. Or the 845-ish. Yeah, it's right around there. Yeah. Yeah. But pretty cool. Very distinct. It looks very different than all the Namiki stuff. So it's worth kind of checking out just to see what Platinum does with their Machia stuff or the Rushi stuff. Uh, and then to swing the pendulum in a very different direction, uh, we have a new Monteverde Ritma color, which is Walnut, which is brown, as you might guess. So what do you think is brown, Drew? Are you a fan? You're like the brown. It's fine. I kind guess. of sore. Yeah. 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 Oh no. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were joking. No, no, like, no. do you like brown in general? I thought no, you no, no. Being... Just like, oh you know, no, this I, brown. It's like, great. Well, like, I mean, not all browns are the. Well, same. what I like most about this pen is that it's a real wood pen, mm-hmm. but the wood is just a sleeve in the center of a pen. It's not like the whole mm. pen, and because yeah. you know you've talked about this before, how wood is not like. To being frank, the best material to make a fountain pen out of. It's, it's, it's tricky. It's, it's tricky. tricky. It's it's finicky. It's yeah. fickle. It's a little bit um, wild. Um, yeah, but because it moves. It, it constantly is absorbing and yeah. releasing moisture. But that only really gets scary when it's you know effect, it can affect the sealing of the pen. But this mm-hmm. one, it's got that same Ritma cap, that same Ritma grip section. The only difference is in the middle. Is wood. Is wood. And yeah. so it's like a sleeve of wood. Yeah, yeah. This is like more similar to the style of pen that I was making back in my pen days. Yeah. Where it was like you had a kit with metal parts, you'd press it together on a tube that you'd turned out of wood. So I like this. Um, yeah. So, I mean, to get any wood pen at this price range is like impossible. Yeah. How much is this one? $48. Dang. So, number six nib. I mean, and the Ritma is a pretty popular pen format. Like, it's a very sturdy pen and you know, it's got the magnetic cap, which is kind of cool. But it's a very sturdy magnetic cap. And it's got that cool thing where you put the cap on the back and then you pull it off and it makes that kind of pop yeah. sound. So that's always fun. Um, but yeah, so uh, it's definitely worth a look if you're into the aesthetic. I love the the um, gunmetal trim. It matches really well with the walnut as well. And this walnut as a wood is a relatively stable wood. So it's not a, not a bad choice to use. Um, 
walnut is very local to Virginia here, so we see yeah. it a little bit. Yeah. you worked with walnut before. I've worked a lot with walnut. Built many, many objects out of walnut. Many pen stands, actually. It's like one of my go-to oh. things for the pen stands that I make as oh. like gifts for people. Yeah. Um, okay. Moving on. Again, we got a lot to cover here. So uh, one thing is very exciting this week, the Kueco Sport. Y'all. Piston Phil fountain pen y'all so this one's had some hype around it for a little while we didn't have a ton of information on it so we were kind of like well we haven't been hyping it up that much but the hype has come anyway um we just got it in like a couple hours ago and it's pretty cool they're so they're 165 for just the pen 175 for the pen with ink and the little tin and all that kind of stuff so um you know it's like pelican m200 kind of price range uh, so it's not going to compete with like Twisby or anything like that. Um, it's a little more of like a next level, you know, kind of steel nib pen. But, you know, for Kueco, it's very good build quality. It was not clear what the pen was actually made of until just very recently for us. But it's aluminum. It's more like an all sport. So it's just called the Kueco Sport Piston Fill Pen, which is why I think it would have been easy to assume that it's made of resin, just like the regular sports are. Usually they have all in front of them if they're aluminum. Right. So really, in my opinion, they could have called this the All Sport Piston Fill Fountain Pen. It would have been a little clearer, but that's okay. As long as you all understand what you're getting and we'll make it clear on the site and all that. It helps from a value standpoint, though. Yeah, and it's like I'll aluminum. Just by the price. Well, and it feels very sturdy too. So like, but it's still pretty light. Aluminum is a relatively light metal. Um, so, you know, even with this, like it, it feels like it's going to be durable. It feels like, you know, it's comfortable to write with. It's still a small pen. Like it is a pocket pen. The actual dimensions of it are basically identical to the regular sport pen. So it's still small, but I really like that it's got the built-in clip. The whole like slide-on clip thing to me is like, you know, that's not carport worthy, like in my opinion, um, to like be able to just knock around anywhere. I feel, I still feel like you need to be like conscious of how you're carrying it. Um, but this one is going to be very sturdy, very sturdy clip. Um, and the piston mechanism is really smooth. I really gotta smooth. say, I'm very pleased with that. And the, it's got a blind cap, so you don't just turn the knob. And then when you look at the knob itself, granted the knob's a little smaller, um, but it's got a cool medallion in the back of the knob that's just kind of like hidden. Oh, I didn't see that. Line cap. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, you don't notice it right away, but when you see it, you're like, oh. Nice. I got you. I was I got really you. impressed with this pen overall. Yeah, it's it's not going to be for everybody because no. it's still like a very specific, the hexagonal, you know, you got to like that Koiko aesthetic. But for me personally, seeing like, oh, they're going to have like an up upscaled piston version of the pen, I'm like, okay, this kind of, this delivers to what I would have expected. And I feel like it's, you're, you're paying for it. Like, I don't feel like it's a screaming deal, but I feel like you're getting what you pay for. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. So meets we'll definitely spotlight it at some point in the future, but um, yeah. we got to get it out in people's hands for a little and bit first. We're probably going to sell out of it right away too. So we don't want to overhype it. So I should probably move on. Um, and then Pelican Edelstein Golden Lapis. This is their Pelican Ink of the Year, special edition, 50 mil, we're not 100% sure what this color looks like because all we've seen are like renderings and stuff. But by the time this video publishes, we're recording this on Tuesday afternoon. I think we're supposed to get the ink in hand tomorrow, maybe. But in Pencast viewing time, this will have already happened. So by the, hopefully by the time you're viewing this, you can at least go onto the product page on our site and see the actual color because by then we hopefully will have gotten it in swabbed it, taken pictures, color adjusted it, and then put it on the website. So I believe it's a blue, it's, 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 bluish teal. It's, it's a blue of some kind. With gold shimmer. Definitely has gold shimmer. Looks rad though. The bottle looks amazing. I mean, those those Edelstein bottles, like the packaging is superb. So um, usually the Edelstein Ink of the Year is pretty popular. I think this one will be too. So if you're interested, go check it out on our website because I think it's going to be popular. I don't know how many we're getting. I don't know how it's going to sell out, but you may want to jump on it. That's what I got, Drew. You also <sighs> have many things. All right. <laughs> so uh, we've got a couple new Waldmans added to our website. Mm. Waldmans are made in Germany pens, mostly sterling silver. Both of these are indeed sterling silver. Mm. We've got the Tuscany in chocolate and rose gold. That one is a little bit less than the other one we'll talk about. The Tuscany is $440. So chocolate and rose gold. We've got a chocolate brown lacquer plating on the pen barrel and then just the chrome-ish sterling silver cap. Both have uh, guilloche. 
Um, no, not just the guilloche cap on this one. So mm-hmm. some some engravings on the uh, yeah. cap. Uh, I had to look up like what's the difference between guilloche and engraving, mm. and I think it's just like guilloche is like a engraving with a machine style. Yeah, versus just mm-hmm. hand engraving. Yeah, so, it's a specific style of engraving. Yeah. N- well, these are just lines. It's not really a. Yeah, but it's the way, it's the method that it's done. Yeah. Yeah. You typically use like what's called a rose engine lathe. Yeah. Um, so you have like mechanical gears basically that you use to pin it in certain locations. And then it can either like wave back and forth. Or you can create like cross hatches and stuff like that. But it's it's a, it's a very time consuming It's more like process. the method than the actual result though. Yeah. Yeah. It is. I think it's defined by the method, but the method usually produces a kind of a a range of specific patterns mm. that are sort of recognizable to the method, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, more often than not. This one that I'm talking about just has a couple lines in it. Mm-hmm. But the next one, the uh, the Commander, so the Waldman Commander is $544. That's the Commander 23 in this case, is a blue cap and silver barrel. Um, this one has both uh, guilloche on the barrel and the cap. So, um, yeah, blue cap, silver barrel. We can check out more online. They're both available now and then we've got a couple new inks the first one coming to us from wearing goal and as you probably guessed it has some shimmer in it this is hades and hades is a black ink with some crazy blue shimmer it's a very very cool Mm -hmm. ink uh we're sold out right now so let's ignore that but Mm -hmm. it's new and it'll come back so yeah you can just get on the wait list if you want um ferris will press we do have these in stocks uh, stock Emerald Gardens is one of their fairy tales inks, so it is 20 milliliters and $20 as well. This is a leaf green ink with duochrome green and gold shimmer. So what? the smaller bottle, the little ball. And then mm. we've got some interesting paper available now, Brian. What? Paper? It's recycled paper. Uh. Not recyclable, recycled paper. Hmm. Oh, I see your face. You're wondering if it's good for fountain pens. I'm skeptical. Don't you give me that skeptical look. Would we I be carrying many... something that's not good for fountain pens? No. No, of course not. Of We've course not. We've vetted it. But... We have vetted it. We tested it. It is, in fact, recycled. The paper, the cover, the whole thing from A to Z, from Alpha to Omega, it is recyclable, and it is all fountain pen friendly. This is 90-gram paper from Claire Fontaine. You know Claire Fontaine knows how to make good paper, so don't this, you worry about that. This is like the only reason we considered it, because it's like, we trust Claire Fontaine. They Heck know yeah. what they're doing, because I have kind of a whole graveyard of other notebooks of recycled paper and other things where it just feathers like a mamma jamma. No, and there's no like, mamma nor jamma on this one. You're like, I guess technically it takes fountain pen ink, but it doesn't take it well. We were surprised but at how Fontaine well does, this, it, it just feels like a fountain pen friendly paper. Honestly, yeah. there there's, there are other papers that we sell that we're currently happy with, and this one still outperforms those. So mm-hmm. you'll be happy with it. Yeah. Um, the uh, colors are orange, red, blue, gray, and green, and you can choose what color. These are not assorted colors like some of the other Claire Fontaine books are. Um, and like I said, these are 90 gram uh, Claire Fontaine, eight millimeter ruled mm-hmm. on all of these. So no different um, line widths or line variations at this point, but um, everything is from 100% recycled from waste paper made in Claire Fontaine's Iverbal factory in France and have the F- FSC recycled certification. And this is some That's info that, that I did not really know if it was important, but I'm gonna go ahead and say it anyway. Mm. Um, this paper is made without de-inking and it is not chlorine treated. Mm-hmm. I don't really know why you would need to de-ink new paper, but okay. Um, or why that's bad, but it features high opacity and superior whiteness compared to other recycled paper, paper and it's still found pen friendly. So the, the chlorine treated thing, usually the chlorine is used to bleach out because you know wood pulp is not naturally bright white. Um, so the technique is often used to bleach it out. So no bleach. Um, but in order to neutralize the bleach, you have to use acid to neutralize it. So if you ever see on the paper designation, it says acid free. Um, that means that there is not, if paper is acidic, that's where it like yellows and becomes brittle over time. Mm -hmm. Um, and it affects it's like archival nature. And I guess de-inking would be like, Hey, we're using recycled paper. So we need to somehow pull this ink out of it. If if there's ink written on the paper. Yeah. But so I don't know exactly the whole process, but. So this I might be just Claire Fontaine. Maybe this is just recycled extra bits from their own factory. It could be like cutoffs of stuff yeah. that just, it was never used, yeah. but you know, they're able to turn it into another product that just makes it, you know, reduce, reuse, Fantastic. recycle. So that's and they're cool. only six bucks each. So 
it's worth easy. A, it's yeah. worth a try. If yeah, you, check them out. If you need some paper, why not give it a shot? Why not buy this paper? Yeah. All right, and finally, we've got a new ink line. So it's not exactly a new brand because the, the brand is Endless, and we have other notebooks from Endless, but this is a new ink from them because they have not previously made ink. Endless Alchemy is the new collection, and like the name implies, these bottles are, they look like wizardry. So uh, they look like scientific flasks. They graduate you know, from top to bottom. They look really fun. They might look unruly, wobbly, and you know, like they're gonna go rogue. Fear not, they come with a cork coaster with a little cutout so the bottle can sit nice and firmly inside of that coaster so it does not weeble, wobble, nor fall down. And they come in four colors. They're all 20 bucks a piece for 60 mil bottles. You can get them in Candy Sea, which is blue, Drops of Mars, which is red, Mystic Forest, which is, you guessed it, green, and Wizard's Pencil, which is gray, like graphite of a pencil that a wizard may use. I don't realize they used specific pencils for wizards. Now, well, they do, and this is what they look like. Maybe just whatever pencil they use becomes a wizard's pencil. It, that's true. Yeah. Technically, so it that could be true. anything. Yes, but indeed. Anyway. Neato. So there you have it. One Not of the more a, unique bottles that I've ever seen. It's definitely unique. Yes. And it's hard to tell from because we had to like look on there. You can see the the color name is like engraved on the very top of the cap. So it's not as obvious in some of the images, but it is on there in case you get multiple bottles of it or whatever. And they're nice colors. I used them. They look nice. They're yeah, pleasant. Very pleasant. It's a fun, good gift item. You know, it's right up there with Claire, uh, with Ferris Wheel Press in terms of presentation and mm -hmm. interesting bottleness and giftability, I'd say. Yeah. Very cool. It's cool to see new stuff. All right. That's the new stuff. Uh, that's what we got. So that's new stuff. Uh, got a couple company, comp, blah, 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 blah. company updates. I forgot how to do all this. <laughs> well, we had the eclipse earlier this week. That was a thing. We, we didn't did. have a. We didn't have the totality. totality. I keep wanting to call it singularity. That's very different. Thing. Oh God. That's very much Please worse. Please no. Uh, totality. Uh, we didn't have totality here in Virginia. Um, but we got to see some eclipseness happening. Over here, we had about 83% like coverage. About 83%. That's a very specific <laughs> approximated number. That's what they said on the website I checked. Fair enough. Um, so yeah, we got some glasses, had some fun mocktails, and had some of those um, those Oreos that are like the space, what are they called? Space? I don't know what they were called, but they had- Space dunk or something They definitely like had that? Pop Rocks inside. They had the, Pop Rocks uh, in them. I did not know that. Yeah. And I ate one because it was like blue and red mm -hmm. cream on the inside. And then it started doing poppy things in my mouth. And I was like, what is going on with this? I was like, are these pop rocks? And then I remembered, I was like, oh yeah, I think they are. That happened to me one time when I got the, you know, 4th of July uh, Oreos and I didn't know they were poppy. And oh. I was like, what's happening in my mouth? Yeah. It was weird. It's weird if you aren't expecting it. No. Yeah, it's but weird. It's very fun if you are expecting it. We had it. moon pies. We had some mm -hmm. space themed fruit roll ups out there. Fun. And uh, oh, some some moon cheese. Have you ever had moon cheese? I saw that over there, and I did not grab it. It's any. just freeze dried cheese. Freeze dried clumps. cheese. You yeah. know, I've had freeze dried um, Starburst and Skittles. Before. Oh yeah, I've had Skittles. Those are really good. I've had Skittles and gummy worms. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I've had freeze dried gummy. Freeze dry freeze drying candy is a thing. It's fun. Yeah, it's a thing now. I mean, I remember one of the only memories I have of like childhood field trips was going to the gift store yeah. or whatever after the thing was done. Uh, and I remember getting like uh, at the science museum, getting the astronaut ice cream. Yeah, we had some on the pencast, dry. remember? Yeah, I remember them. Heck yeah, man. Yeah, and it was uh, exactly what I remembered it being. Delicious. Yeah, it's good. Freeze dried stuff is fun. Um, and then uh, let's see here, what else we have? We have what's new video with Drew. He hasn't shot it yet as of the recording this, but- I'm gonna. There's plenty. Plenty to talk about, because all this stuff that we told you was coming is now starting to arrive. Yeah. So lots of good fun stuff happening right now, and you can check out Drew's impressions of them. Um, and then, you know, this will already probably have happened by the time you see this, but we have another mental health half day Friday this week, um, which is fun. I'm like, oh, we have that already, because I was off last week. So I'm like, okay, I don't feel like I need it yet, but I'll take advantage of it. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Do you have any plans for your... Half day, or are you gonna I think figure I've, something out? Oh no, I know. I'm gonna go to Waffle House, and I'm gonna go home and watch a movie. I've got, Ooh, I've, I've been. What movie? I, that's a good question. So I've mm. been reacquiring some physical media discs. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I've been acquiring some that haven't quite been Archer appropriate. 
So okay. I believe I'm going to go with Blade Runner 2049 or Terminator 2. Okay. I haven't seen Blade Runner 2049. Is it good? Uh, yeah, it is. I've heard it. it told, it's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. It's it's a very atmospheric mm. movie. Good, good, strong visuals. So, okay. yeah, it's going to be a nice, you know, in the dark, cozy mm. in the love sack, mm-hmm. big audio. <sighs> nice. Yeah. Looking nice. forward to it. Okay. Um, yeah. I don't know what I'm going to do. I might figure it out. I recommend Waffle House. I've heard that you. When like was the last do time that? you've been to Waffle House, Brian? Um, it's been a little bit, like years. I had a good impression, in maybe a couple of years. Okay, it might have been with you last time I ate at like a pen show or something. Maybe not Atlanta. <sighs> that was a long time ago. It was that. That was the last time we went. Like that's the Waffle House. It might have been <gasps> the last time I went. That was like a that was like six years ago. Well, next time, point. next time you're just feeling like you feel weird for a reason you can't explain. That's why. <laughs> that's why uh, i just don't have enough waffle house in my life i saw an amazing photo with waffle house with the eclipse in the background oh looked majestic <laughs> yeah. i'm sure there's plenty of waffle houses that were in the totality all right um i don't know i'll figure it out i'll let y'all know next week what i've done it'll be something it'll be so mentally healthy get ready i might be playing snow runner i'll talk more about that later on in this pencast uh let's move on to q a all right, we are kicking things off on the Q and the A Let's kick it. with Morgan today. Uh, Morgan mm-hmm. says, I want a gold nib pen, uh-huh. but I hate posting my pens. So the E95S mm-hmm. is probably too short. Uh. I hold my pens a little funny, so the clip on the vanishing point would also drive me insane. Help! Mm. Well, okay. So you think this person probably wants a more entry-level gold nib pen? I mean, that's kind of what I'm inferring a looking, little bit. Looking at the E95S and the Vanishing Point. Yeah, probably. I mean, those are both great pens, even if you're not thinking like budget necessarily. Agreed. Um, interesting though, like the, see for me, posting is annoying if the cap is like really long or it throws off the balance or it feels like it's not posting securely. I would think the E95S is like one of the most pleasing posting yes. experiences you can have, but what you got Morgan, going on, Morgan? Morgan, you hate it. I'm going to take your word on that. I So we'll just not even go near any pens that are that are postable um, or need to be posted, I should right. say. So I'm sure pump, some people would say the E95S doesn't need to be posted, but y- y'all, come on. It's supposed to be posted. Well, so that might, that might depend on your hand size, right? Yeah. Like if you got fairly small hands, you might not find – like that's where I could see – and then again, we have partial information here. Maybe Morgan's got small hands and just posting any pen just really throws the balance off or it feels like ridiculous or too long or whatever. I get, I get that. I get that. Um, I am on the opposite end of that spectrum. <laughs> uh, I, you know, for me, pens that are too small, like an E95S, like I really can't write with it unposted because it's way too short. No, I, um, neither can I. Yeah, even, even, po- like- even pocket pens that are posted for me are pushing it. In yeah, terms like of their length. Even the uh, the uh, Coeco Sport, you know that. That's, yeah, that's oh, still that's that still thing. a small pen. Yeah, even absolutely posted or not, uh, not yeah. posted, it's impossible. But it's not impossible, but it's difficult. Yeah. Um. So, but again, it all depends on how you hold your pen. Look, you sound like you know what you want, and I respect that. Um. So I think, based on what you're describing, that the most important factor here is going to be the length of the body of the pen. So not taking the cap into account. So if you look at, we, we take detailed measurements of every pen we carry. It's like a step in our process. It's kind of time consuming, but it's really helpful. So if you go into any product page of any pen that we have and you click on the technical specs, so it's gonna be like, if you scroll down past the main images and the, the top description and stuff, you know, it'll have three different things you can click on. Technical specs is the one in the middle and it will give you all the detailed measurements that we have for the thing. The one that you want to look at is called length's body. So that is literally the end of the pen, like where you would normally post the pen, uh, all the way to the tip of the nib. So it's not just the part that you hold, it includes the tip and the nib. Whole thing. So I think that matters because the tip of the nib is like where it's touching the page. Soup to nuts. Yeah, so like if you had a really long or really short nib, that is important. Um, So you just want to, um, you know, kind of look at that measurement, I would think. Um, I think it's going to be different for everybody how long of a pen is acceptable. 
um, in terms of, uh, you know, what's comfortable unposted. I looked at the E95S. So that one body with no cap is 105 millimeters long. So I was like, okay, let's say that that's too short for Morgan, which I kind of agree. Um, so you'll want to look at things that are longer than that. So take a look at whatever pen is of interest to you and look at for something longer. Um, so I have some recommendations of ones that I think are worth looking at that are all longer, but it might be good for you to kind of pick a pen that you have that's like as short as you would, you know, want it to be. And then either you could either measure it yourself or if it's a pen that we have on our site, you could see the measurements that we've done and see that length of the body and then at least go with that or longer. And then I think you'd be fine. Um, so some recommendations that I have is um, going with the Golden Nib Pilot Custom 74. You know, you went with some entry-level pilots. I love the Pilot Custom 74. The body is pretty long. Um, and it's a pretty light pen too. Nib writes great. Um, really any of the customs you could pretty much go with cause they all have fairly long bodies. So I don't think you're going to be approaching discomfort with, uh, um, without posting. So custom 743, 823, 912, 845. And why not custom you I'll throw that in there too. If you really want to go nuts, that pen, uh, even for me writing with it posted is a bit much, especially cause the, large the diameter on that cap is like having this Contigo mug on the back of the pen. Mm -hmm. It's like quite large. Oh, one to one. Uh, um, Pilot Falcon maybe? I like that. This is one where it's like, I I want to post that pen. Like it's not, it's like on the lower limit for me. So I, I looked up that one. It's 123 millimeters long. So for me, like 120 would probably be like the bare minimum that I would want. Mm -hmm. So just to kind of think for yourself where you might fall in that range. Um, I think the Platinum and Sailor pens would also work. The Pro Gear Slim would probably be a little bit too short. So that one, that's only 109 millimeters. So okay. it's not as short as the E95S, but it's close. And I think that that would probably not be so comfortable. I have to post those. Yeah. So maybe not that one, but the the full size Pure Gear, King of Pens for sure. Um, any of those would be good. Pretty much any of the Platinums I think would be fine. Um, the Homo Sapiens, Viscani Homo Sapiens. I don't know what your budget is, but assuming you just, what you just want recommendations. Um, Homo Sapiens, that pen is very long. I actually don't post that pen because it's really long and the cap is pretty heavy. So it really throws the weight off. It doesn't post, post very pen. deep either. It doesn't post deep at all. So it's like, you feel like you're writing with like a wand. It's like really long and heavy. So that one's not, that one I think is actually better as a non, I mean, you can post it, but I think it's actually better as an unposted pen. Um, and then I had the Magna Carta Mag 600 in here too. That's a nice long bodied pen. Um, the cap is really light, so it doesn't really throw off the weight too much if you're posting it, but um, very comfortable pen, even for my hand size to write with it unposted. In fact, that's usually how I end up writing with that one. And it's got a really fun nib. It's just very different. So I think we might as well throw that one in the mix while we're, while we're going at it. Yeah. So those are some of my recommendations. Yeah. I would say that, um, speaking of pens that just kind of aren't really so, like, good for posting, mm. uh, there are quite a few, uh, the Twisby 580, the Twisby VAC 700, those mm. aren't really supposed to be posted. You, yeah, the you, 580 actually Twisby says it's not a postable pen. Yeah. So we actually I don't we don't we don't say it's a postable no. pen on our site. You can post it. So right there is like it's all right. Of, that one kind of makes your decision for you. Don't yeah, post five, it. 580 would be good, but that doesn't yeah, there's gold, literally that a, have a gold nib though. Oh, that's right. So, We're looking yeah, for a gold nib. Yeah, looking yeah, for gold that's nib. right. I'm looking for gold nib. Yep. Dang, forgot about those. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yep, not yep, a yep, lot. yep. Yep. I mean, I was, it's still a good pen. It's I worth, was just thinking about like pens that would be terrible to post, like the Parallel, the Joy. The Parallel. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> they like it's not really a post. It's more of a you can sort of hang the yeah, cap on the back barely. of the pen. Yeah. Yeah. No, I like I like that. Um, you know, those are all good choices. Yeah. You had one in here, the Lamy 2000. The Lamy 2000. That I thought about Lamy 2000 because um, Morgan mentioned that they have a little bit of a strange grip and. One of my favorite things mm. about the 2000 is that you can kind of grip that pen anywhere. Yeah, like there's even like nothing getting in your way. Even way off of the so-called grip section, because the grip section of the 2000 is just another part of the barrel. It's all smooth. Yeah, yeah. It, just it, transitions. It, it's, it looks different. It's a different material, but mm -hmm. it's not really a dedicated grip section because it doesn't mm. change the profile at all. So. Um, that one, as far as grip ability goes, does give you a ton of options. Mm. Honestly, you see how long that body is on the 2000 because the baseline. of the way the two that because of the tiny, tiny, tiny nib on the 2000, I sometimes don't even grip it 
at the stainless steel part of the pen sometimes i'm hold it further back yeah. i'm like right at the edge like right before it becomes stainless steel i, I use, tend to yeah. grip it back there so that pen's 125 millimeters long in the body that's that's very sufficient that's almost yeah. five inches long yeah so that's like i mean i still post mine but I've, I've also not posted it and been totally well, the happy. cap on that one posts super deep it does. too so i love that let me see here i think we have the length posted yeah, it adds like one inch, basically, 154 millimeters. I love a deep versus post. Versus 125 millimeters. So love it. That's kind of crazy that the cap is that long, but like maybe a third of it is actually adding length onto the pen when it's posted. That's a very that's a very deep post. Um, we hate that pen here, though. Yeah, we don't like talking about it very much. Forget the Lama 2000. <laughs> don't buy one. Put it on your bingo garden. Okay, cool. Well, that was a fun question. Thank yeah. you for asking that. Hopefully that helps you out, Morgan. All right, Drew, I got one for you. Okay. Jobby says, hey, Brian and Drew, I just got married last week. <gasps> well, congratulations. I wanted to use Pilot's, Pilot's Carbon Ink to sign the marriage license. I think you mean Platinum Carbon Black. That's what I'm, that's what I'm assuming. But maybe the Pilot has a carbon ink I'm not aware of. Um, but they told us that we couldn't use them because it can mess up their scanners. Who is this they? Hmm. And what are they scanning all the hmm. time? Um, now I have a whole bottle of waterproof ink that I may use for watercoloring, but I was wondering what else I could use the tons of ink I collect apart from the casual ink swatch. Bonus question, what documents do you know that fountain pen ink cannot be used? Very interesting question. Okay. First off, Javi, I think it's Javi. Um, Javi. Oh, uh, sorry about that. I'm skeptical about this scanner situation. Mm. The ink that is in a roller ball mm -hmm. is not unlike the ink that's in a fountain pen. Yeah, it's like a pigmented gel ink. Well, but this is this is this is liquid. Like, you know, a roller ball is liquid ink. It's not as liquidy. It's not as liquidy, but it's as, not like as fountain pens. But unless you have something like a pilot precise, like that will use like liquid but they wouldn't say like a feed mechanism they wouldn't say boo to that though i would hope not but no i mm, I, I think they just were unfamiliar with the what the fountain pen was that's what i think that's what i think i think the hobby had to deal with somebody that was just a little a little, little freaked out, out by mm. what he had in his arsenal there maybe so maybe um, i don't know maybe maybe we don't know about scannings we um both got hitched before fountain pens had entered our entered our lives that's so true. neither of us signed our marriage licenses with fountain pens. However, I have signed plenty of legally binding documents, mm -hmm. um, like both of my houses. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't own two houses currently, but I have since. <laughs> <laughs> so, you have signed for <laughs> yes, two houses at points with in your life. Pens. <laughs> um, and I have to believe that such a document is equivalent in its importance to a, a marriage document, right? So yeah, I would say so. I, I've and. I would be willing to bet there have been plenty of fountain pen signings of marriage licenses. So I don't know. Well, well, well there was a time when that was the primary signing thing was fountain pens. Like that was, yeah, you weren't signing it with typewriters. So you were I don't it need to spend pens, all yeah. all day long talking about how skeptical I am of this person. But anyway, uh, carbon ink. So that is a great ink. And honestly, as far as having a bunch of extra ink goes, there are way more useless colors to have. <laughs> Than carbon True. black. Yeah, that's I mean, probably one of the best ones to right? have to that's use for random things. Absolutely. So that ink has such a wide variety of applications. It's one of it is one of the most popular, like kind of standard default inks for a multitude of fountain pen users and writers and artists. So you are actually set up pretty okay, Javi. So. Now, Drew, what is carbon ink? Is carbon. it just the name of the color, or is there some? different property to it that makes it unique. There's different properties. Um, <gasps> really? So it's a pigmented ink. Tell us ink. about it. Well. What does the pigmented mean, Drew? Pigmented. Most, <laughs> most fountain pen inks are water-based inks, meaning mm -hmm. they have a dye and water component. Most of it is water with a little bit of dye. That is water-soluble. It mixes in completely with the watery base, and it is just always one. It becomes one solid unit of liquid. Pigmented ink is a little bit different. It is a solid particulate in liquid suspension, still water-based, but the color does not come from dye. It comes from pigment, which is more like, you know, 
paint. It just kind of chills in there. It stays in suspension. It doesn't like settle to the bottom like shimmer or anything, but it is a different avenue for the ink to achieve its color. And it is more often associated with properties like permanence, including water resistance and sun defense. UV resistance. UV resistance. Yeah. Light fastness. Light fastness. Called. That's what I was like. Yeah. Because ah. yeah, um, it's, it's like there's a physical particulate there, you know, just like you would have, um, this might be too obscure of a reference, but like having latex paint has got pigment in it yeah. versus like, you know, a clear stain that you would put on your deck, which doesn't have pigment to it that is gonna be way less protective than the paint would be, right? Because yeah. it's physically blocking the UV rays. So that's what this ink is good for. It's great. It's a nice, rich, rich black. It is a little bit more, you know, of a chore to clean out, but not by a lot. If it dries out completely in the pen. I don't think if you're using it just as a regular ink that it's- As long as it really stays wet, you're fine. But yeah, what's left behind is a solid thing. Whereas if dye is left behind, you just kind of mix it up with water and it wakes up and it's like, oh, I can be ink again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not quite the same with pigment, but if you've got it in your hands and you need to find some stuff to do with it, you can do a lot with it. Hey, you can write it, write with fountain pens. It's mm -hmm. a great ink. One of my favorite things about Platinum Carbon Black is that even in the most fine, fine nib, it still is really rich and saturated mm -hmm. and still looks black, you know? Yeah. Um, not quite as black as the Chalkuro, which they invented, which is insane, but Plenty black for your purposes, for sure. But a lot of artists also use it because it is great for watercolors and things like that. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to use up a lot of it, you can try using things other than fountain pens. You can try using brushes. You can use a brush pen, which is great and a lot of fun to do hand lettering with. You can just get a big honking stub nib to outline certain characters. If you happen to like doodling, mm -hmm. one of my favorite things to do is, I'm not an artist, but I do like to doodle. One of my favorite things to do is doodle a little character, a little monster, a weird face, and then heavily outline it. Like you'd be surprised just how much more complete or a finished look you can give something by putting a big outline around it. It almost makes it look more professional. Like, oh, look, I actually did something. This doesn't look like a doodle now. It looks intentional. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love doing that. And then you could also choose to go down the route of the Pilot Parallel. If you grab one of the 6.0 parallels, that thing is going to be an ink monster. You're gonna put mm -hmm. down a ton of ink and before you know it, your platinum carbon black will be gone. Um, and it is great because you can practice a bunch of different lettering techniques. It comes with a little guidebook on you know how to do the Gothic alphabet and stuff like that. So if you did wanna kind of practice you know, Gothic script, it's a lot of fun to do. And Platinum Carbon Black is a great ink to do that with. Mm. So yeah, or if you just wanted to try out like a double broad nib, we don't have too many of them, but they do exist. Or like a pilot course nib, like you've wrote, written with some of those. Those mm -hmm. are gushers. Yeah. So- um, Real gusher. Or like the um, Naganata Togi from mm -hmm. Sailor. That thing can be an ink monster as well to go with your term. Um, another thing it's really good for, so the light, the the light, not the light fat. Well, light fastness is really good for if you're doing artwork because it, you know, you're, that's a really important thing for any art that you want to last at all, especially if it's displayed. Um, generally speaking though, if you're using fountain pens for artwork, you probably want to keep it closed up in a notebook. You don't want to display it because as a general rule, fountain pen ink is not very light fast. Um, but another benefit too, I don't know if you'll be in this situation, Hobby, but it could be helpful for some of you out there. Um, it's really good for taking notes, especially if you want to highlight over top of what you've written. So problem with a lot of fountain pen inks is because they're not completely like water resistant, if you use a highlighter, you're essentially wetting over top of it and you're gonna get a lot of smearing that can happen. But Carbon Black is one of those inks that's really good for highlighting over top of because the ink doesn't really go anywhere. Um, so it can be really good for that. And then um, if you have any type of paper that you're using that's really ink resistant, because this type of ink you know, the pigments dry more on the surface. Like if you have a really heavily sized paper, um, it does better for, um, you know, sticking kind of on top of those papers. I'm not, not quite to the degree of like photo paper, the stuff that's like almost plasticky shiny, but even like magazines and stuff like that that are like really coated, these carbon- That's what like he means these, by heavily sized. Yeah, size, it's like a coating that's on the paper that makes it really slick. Um, that uh, can actually work really well with the pigmented inks because it kind of the ink kind of dries more on top as opposed to needing to soak in to get its permanent qualities. So um, it's a little more versatile in that way. 
Um, yeah. And then the follow-up question here about like what documents are like not so great for it. So as far as I know, there's no document, there's no like universal document as opposed to like the use or type of document itself. It has more to do with the paper that it's on, I think. So for me, one, to talk about the whole scanning thing, again, the reason it's so suspect, I think, too, is because if you're scanning a pigmented ink, I think that would actually be the best ink to scan because it's going to have those like pigmented properties to it. It's going to it's going to absorb that light better than any other type of ink you would use. I would think literally it would be the best ink that you could possibly have yeah. and because it dries more on the surface. Anyway, you were told what you were told and that's fine. You sign whatever you need to for that document. Um, but there's a couple of types of paper where fountain pen ink in general, you got to kind of watch out. Um, one of it, this can be kind of tricky, but like the multi-sheet like carbon copy paper where you like press down, there's like you know, the top one's white, then you have like a yellow one or a pink one or whatever, where you have to like press hard through multiple sheets to get it to show through. Not that you can't use a fountain pen for that, but you certainly wouldn't want to use one with like any type of a soft nib or a gold nib or anything like that because you'd have to basically mash the nib down. Um, this is the only thing where I've heard some people like, if they're really bound and determined, they'll do that. But that's, it's really made for pens like a ballpoint where you can really bear down on the thing and, and get it through the paper. So fountain pens are kind of designed for the opposite of that. They're designed to not have to press hard. So they're not the best for that. Um, and then kind of what I mentioned, like any photo paper, any like really, really slick, really ink resistant paper, fountain pen ink is not going to work quite as well. Usually for those, you want some kind of like felt tip or like a Sharpie, something that's like solvent based, honestly, not even water based. Um, those that would be kind of a uh, thing. The only other thing I can think of is like Scantron forms, like back in school, back in the day, I asked my kids, I was like, do y'all use Scantron forms? And they're like, what are you talking about? Like, they didn't even know what I was talking about because they're like, everything we do is on the computer for like all their formal testing. But I mean, like for like voting and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, they still use them for voting. You still have to use them. And like, but they use ballpoint pens for those. It's like, why couldn't you use a fountain pen for that? I don't know that you can't unless I'm wrong, but I could be mistaken. Now, the thing I will say is not all fountain pen inks do scan particularly great. Some of the lighter colors and stuff won't actually scan very sure. well. But a pigmented black ink, I think, would be Yeah, Maybe it was less, great for them. Uh, less about the ink and more about like the fountain pen was just a variable that they did not feel willing that's to probably, contend with. That's probably more the fact. Yeah, yeah more of the thing that's going on. Um, but yes, I would say like anything like that, that's like a standardized form that has to go into a machine. It's probably not that fountain pen ink can't be used, but I mean, we have what, over 800 colors of fountain pen ink. You know, anyone who's like getting that form and they see whatever you're using random pen with random ink, they're Noodler, not going to know. Noodler's blue ghost. They're not going to, yeah, right. <laughs> they're not going to know what you're what you're dealing with so they'll probably just tell you you shouldn't use that type of pen with it but it doesn't mean you can't be used but it might be uh just a little suspect so anyway that's what i got there we go cool all, all right. right question three <clears throat> is from Oops. sijal hello you covered the topic of unique materials and creative designs in a fountain pen Mm. Wondering if someone tried to add tech gadgets like Bluetooth mini speakers mm. or sensors that could detect ink level or ink pressure on the page and share with an app or smart LED lights on the page showcasing ink characteristics as the nib touches the paper and the ink is still wet or tech that translates Ooh. the handwriting on paper in an MS Word format. There's a lot of... A lot of options here, a lot of ideas. It will encourage the younger generation to experience fountain pen writing. Hmm. It seems like a no-brainer. Keen to hear your thoughts on this, whether companies have thought about this or if it's not feasible at all. Interesting. This is a very interesting question. I mean, clearly uh, Sajal has some has some thoughts. You got has, ideas, Sajal. Has some ideas, yeah. Yeah, you need to be doing something with those. Um, very interesting question. Um, so this is something that's not like new in the fountain pen world. In fact, you know, we've been around for, this will be our 15th year as Goulet pens selling fountain pens. Um, I was, I feel like I was seeing a lot more of this type of conversation more like a decade ago. 
as like social media was coming up, e-commerce was coming up. There was definitely a lot more talk in the fountain pen kind of industry about, you know, the rise of digital media kind of making fountain pens obsolete. Uh, there was a lot more of like a pessimistic view and kind of a, a little bit of a dystopian view of what technology was doing to fountain pens when we first got into this business, honestly, kind of more so than I even see right now. Like, I, I don't- I, I agree. Yeah, you, you've, been, was, you've been at this a while. There was also the, around the time people thought that e-readers and like, you know, Kindles and Nooks were gonna just right. kill books. Right. And they didn't. They haven't, yeah. Not like, even a little bit. Well, like physical media, I think, I think maybe that's some of the difference is like, there's been a little bit of time now to see how we have as a society have kind of absorbed some digital media. Has it, you know, fully replaced the need for physical media? In some ways, you could argue. You know, I think for the more commoditized things, sure. Like I use, I, I do not use a paper planner. I have no desire to personally because it just doesn't suit my lifestyle. A digital one makes a lot more sense for me. And uh, there's no, um, there's no gadget kind of stuff that's going to really change that for me, I don't think, nor do I like have a desire to make that happen. Because to me, that's like, I'm trying to solve a problem with something that's not the ideal solution in that way. Um, you know, there's, there's already something else that solves that way better. So for me, like a fountain pen, it serves a, it serves kind of a different purpose. Like, I don't think the answer to fountain pen technology being relevant to the next generation is in trying to adapt it into the commoditized use of writing instruments. If, does that does that make sense? It does. So like trying to, I don't know, dress it up or jazz it up to make it still be mainstream. Cause I don't, I think things are evolving too fast. I don't think you're gonna get hit, hit anybody if you do that. Yeah, you're gonna be like jack of all trades, master of You're none. gonna be in kind of like a dead zone. Yeah, like uncanny valley of gadgetry. Um, I, you know, I think it's kind of like, well, like Drew, you're kind of a, a case study for this. One could argue you are interested in like new media, you know, PS5 and, you know, gaming consoles and stuff like that. But you also collect things like VHS tapes and, and your, your older physical media, but you're not, you're not like trying to get them to serve the same purpose necessarily, even though it's a, you could argue it's a similar media like you're using them for different purposes, right? Hmm. Like you could argue that. Um, I think it's kind of the same thing with, with fountain pens. Um, so, I mean, honestly, there I haven't seen a lot of pens, specifically I haven't seen a lot of pens that have any type of digital technology incorporated into them. Um, there's been more like Kickstarter type things that I've seen in the last decade that not they're not even really fountain pens. I've seen other types of pens I think because when you have a rollerball pen or a ballpoint pen, you can get a relatively thin kind of ink stick inside of there. And then you have a lot more room to work with with the body of the pen. With a fountain pen, they're already kind of girthier pens, tend to be a little bit heavier, a little bit bigger. So you go shoving a bunch of tech in there. And now you're pushing the limits of like what's going to be practical to use as a pen. You know, so I think you already just don't have just literally physically a lot of room to work with. Um, and then let alone, like, do you need Bluetooth speakers on your pen? Like almost all of us have a phone that has better speakers than we're ever going to put on a pen. And it's got your music library and everything in there. Like, I'm like, what problem is that solving? Um, I think most technology that you would try to put into a pen, you're, you know, more of a solution looking for a problem than the other way around. Does that make sense? Um, and then like the things that are specific to like showing your ink level on a pen, I'm like, well, like an ink window addresses that pretty easily. You know, it's like, we don't need to over, over engineer our products and shoehorning digital technology into them. I, you know, having kids now that are 12 and 14, this is actually like the really fun dinner conversations I get to have with my kids now is asking them about this kind of stuff because they're, you know, they're not brand new to the world and, my, it's so funny, Joseph. He's he's only fourteen, but he already is like has these like little existential moments where he's like, "Oh my gosh!" He's like, "It's already April." He's like, "Time is going by so fast," you know. And, he's, and I'm like, "Dude, you're too young to feel like 
time is slipping away, but like he's very aware of that kind of stuff. Um, so I get to ask him about, you know, stuff like this. That's like, hey, what do what do kids your age like? What is appealing? What is that kind of stuff? And it's just very interesting to see like what kids find appealing and what they don't. It just because there is a lot of digital technology around them and in their life doesn't mean they want it on everything. Like they'll use it for different purposes than what we would imagine. Like this is part of what's so interesting with technological advances that happen over time um, is, you know, the technology can get invented, but then the next generation that comes up is going to not be burdened with the knowledge of the way things used to be. So they are going to create and invent ways to use that technology in ways that the people that invented it maybe didn't even imagine. Does that make sense? So like my kids are into digital things for sure, but like Joseph will spend hours and hours and hours building Lego stuff. And he loves drawing with a pencil and making like Sonic the Hedgehog comics and storytelling and stuff like that. And Ellie does all kinds of art and crafts. She'll use digital stuff. Like they create tons of digital art on like an iPad and stuff like that, but they still use analog stuff. And they, there's a little bit of merging that happens between the two, but they still keep their media fairly separate, partly because like it's an experiential thing, like the tactile stuff. It's a different experience. And when you start shoving a bunch of technology into it, it, it kind of like, it feels like it's invading that experience a little bit. I don't know. So, I mean, like I've not seen a lot of technology getting like shoved into fountain pen products. The ones that I've seen the most have probably been paper products. I think because paper probably more so than fountain pens even is like felt more of like the existential threat of relevance as we go literally paperless as the term that gets used. Um, certainly if you're paperless, then fountain pens would also therefore not have any use. Um, but yeah, there's like a lot of paper products that have gone into like the, you can scan it and it uploads to a thing. But I don't know, I was looking into that and it's like, it was kind of funny because I was like, I don't even really do that a lot myself. Like we have Google Docs and we have, you know, stuff that we use for meetings and I've my notes are digital that I do for the pencast. But like, I don't, I really don't like scan and upload my handwritten notes into digital form. I guess I could, I probably should look into that more because there's use cases for that. Um, but I was even looking at that and it's like, you know, I think there's a lot more instances of digital products having success going more analog than the other way around. Does that make sense? So mm -hmm. like rather than taking fountain pens and trying to make them digital, you see more success with something like the Kindle. You, know, you talk about like e-readers and stuff. Well, the e-readers really didn't start to take off until they didn't feel like it was a piece of digital technology, until it felt more like an analog product, like you were just reading like a newspaper or a book, um, you know, the, the iPad, you know, for like pencil drawing and some of the, that kind of artwork, you know, and having like a more actual tactile experience or like there's a tablet called Remarkable um, that I've seen people use that's like one for kind of like note taking, but it's, it's a little bit more like the Kindle kind of e-reader type format. It's not like an iPad, like LCD backlit screen, um, but it's, it's kind of that, but it crosses over digitally. So it's like, but even then it's like, it's still different, you know, like you're not getting the fountain pen ink in the whole thing. Yeah, you know, like it's, it's, it's different. So I don't know, for me, I think, I think they can be distinctly separate. Um, and I really haven't seen a lot of companies, especially fountain pen companies trying to even make that happen unless I'm just totally missing stuff. Um, I know that Monteverde had one pen. It wasn't a fountain pen, it was a ballpoint, but it had like a, uh, a couple of buttons on it that you connect with Bluetooth to your phone. I think they called it the selfie pen. Do you have one of those? I do have one. I thought you did. It's really large and bulky and, you know, so you can hold this pen and set up your phone and push the button and take the picture, which, okay, that's fine. But like, does that need to be in a pen? You know? <laughs> and they, they at one point were putting stylus tips on everything. Well, I mean, there's a, use case for stylus tips that's they've, I guess, they've, they've, they've backed it out you on know what that. okay i forgot about the stylus tips yeah. they the, i guess it's not as much of like a, no it was it, it it had already peaked like it's, it's yeah it's on the decline now yeah but you used to see stylus tips on all sorts of writing instruments for sure Fountain pens included yeah that honestly so that's not like so that's interesting it's not like actual digital technology in there but no the use for it is related yeah. to digital technology right 
So that actually, that's, so that's, that's probably as close as probably the strongest yeah. use case for something that actually is practical to put on a pen. But even still, it, I wouldn't say that it was necessarily mainstream and certainly wasn't related to fountain pens. No. Um, in fact, I'm trying to think there were, we, we've sold like a couple of fountain pens that had the stylus tip, like the tool pen mm -hmm. that has stylus tip on it. The a couple other Monteverdes, a couple other Monteverdes yeah. had it on there, but that was kind of it. It's not really that big of a thing. So yeah, yeah I don't know. Um, I like think, when, when is that more handy than your finger? Um, I know for like, you know, some people, they just like are not as accurate with their finger or something like that. Or if you, I don't know, have like calluses or have like, you know, whatever, I don't know. I don't use a stylus on a regular basis, so I don't really know, but I know that people use them. Um, and then, you know, as I was looking into the, I, I sort of wavered away from this topic, but I can, um, talking about like the taking the, the analog notes and converting them into digital form. Um, so there were some notebooks and stuff that you could like scan a QR code and do all that type of stuff. But now I'm like, pretty much everybody has a smartphone and like now you have like AI and stuff in there. You can literally take a picture and it can analyze and do like everything. So it's like trying to put some kind of technology like that into an analog product now mm -hmm. does not make any sense. Um, so Microsoft OneNote, Google Drive, um, I haven't played with this. I wasn't even aware of this, but iOS has this thing called live text where you can literally just take a picture in your camera app on your phone and it'll convert it into digital, like take your handwriting and convert it into digital. And I was like, oh, that right there might be the only thing I ever need. I don't even have to download a new app, you know? So it's like you have digital solutions for analog stuff that it's like is being developed faster than would make sense to try to put it. I think like keeping the analog stuff for what it is, make great fountain pens and just let people enjoy them for that experience. And I don't think that it is gonna be like totally replaced by digital technology. I think the two can coexist and live harmoniously, but it's just might be used for a slightly different purpose, you know? Yeah, I think that there's a good bit of evidence for what you're saying and how separate I think the appeal is and just going to a big box store like Target and seeing how many CDs they have available mm. versus how many vinyl records they have available. Right. Because when you think about that, the CD does go into a bit of digital technology. Yeah, absolutely. But that section is almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. However, the vinyl record section is quite sizable these days. I think I think I read somewhere that last year was the most vinyl record sales in like on record. Like that, like they sold more vinyl records than ever before or something like that. I could be wrong about that. Or maybe it was just in recent history or, or yeah. vinyl records outsold all other media or something like that. Um, but either way, what vinyl records have been on the uprise. And that, the that is a strictly years. analog system for, for, for the most part, you know, depend, you could play them on, you know, digital. Digital you know, work. Yeah, you, you can know. have like a digitally, but still like. It's an analog it's, unit. It's an analog unit yeah. that you at best can convert into a digital like sound system. hundred percent. And I would, and I would wager that, you know, in 10 years, a film camera might be a bigger industry than, you know, a consumer grade digital camera. Hmm. Just because people that want an analog experience want a truly analog experience. Hmm. The hmm. more phones gain in terms of technology, the closer they're going to get to the high end digital cameras. I don't care how good the camera is. Like phone tech is catching up to it like hmm. rapidly. Yeah. And but yet an analog camera that takes film is still going to have its appeal no well, matter then, how advanced phones get. And then you could argue too, if you really want to get like ethereal about this kind of stuff, like looking at things like the Oculus and the Vision Pro and all that kind of stuff, like the devices themselves, it's argued that like smartphones, you know, they're not the foregone conclusion for the rest of our lives. It may just be an intermediary technology like CDs where we may all be walking around with glasses or goggles or contacts or no tech is final tech. Or, yeah. So it's like, you know, what's to say that any of this digital stuff is going to exist in its current form 10 years from now, nah. we could all be walking around with goggles on our face, you know, living in an augmented reality most of the time. But I, I still don't think that like, no matter what you do with that tech, it's not going to give you the same analog experience that you would have with something like a fountain no, pen. I think so there's like the further we get removed from an analog experience, the more special 
and intentional that analog experience becomes. 100%. So I don't think it'll be as mainstream as it once was. But at the same time, I think it'll be that much more valued by the people that use yeah. them. Right? And there's something to be said, like you don't want it to be closer tied to modern tech because that departure from modern tech is such a large part of the appeal. Part of the draw, right? Absolutely. Yeah, it's a like, huge part of the draw. That's why people still collect and use typewriters for fun. That's why people do use film cameras for fun. Yeah. That's why you know people enjoy the sound of a vinyl record and the use of a vinyl record. Using a vinyl, sorry, not using, I, mean, I, I got corrected by Trevor one day for saying vinyls. I know that's not correct mm. for using vinyl. It's always singular. Um, oh, interesting. Okay. The, you, you, don't, you can't just like skip and skip and skip and have Spotify feed you random songs. You listen to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. You take in the album. Right. And it's the same process with using a film camera. Take your shot seriously. Pick your moment because mm. that's what you're going to get and you're not going to know how good it is. That, so take your time. Fountain hmm. pens are the same way. Take your time. Slow down. Enjoy the process. And that's why analog has its appeal to, hmm. to me anyway. So Because I need that. I need to take a moment. And that's I was talking today. That's one reason I love hot beverages so much hmm. is because you can't just chug them. You, you take a moment. It's a peaceful, warm, just kind of chill experience and just hmm. kind of like enjoying tea or coffee or hot chocolate, apple cider, whatever. It's just like, hey, take a sip, relax, hmm. have a moment. Um, hmm. Now, you know what was brilliant in incorporating unnecessary technology when Oakley came out with the Oakley thumps or whatever they called them. I had the MP3 player in the oh, side. Yeah. And I had little things coming into your ears. Mm. Terrible. Absolutely mm. terrible. Thumps. I, it was something like that. It wasn't, <laughs> I want to say beats, but obviously, no, that's those are the headphones. That's dray, but it was yeah. something like that. Just terrible. I feel like that was a big thing like 10 years ago was like... Put, all, he, put like, headphones on everything. Well, like wearable tech. That oh, was yeah. a very buzzwordy, catchy Headphones kind of thing. and hoodies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, I mean, case in point, I have a backpack that has like a USB connection in it. But I'm like, this is USB A. This is not USB C. So this is already starting to get outdated. And I just have this extra cord like dangling around in my backpack. <laughs> And it's like still relevant enough, but I never use it. Like this backpack now has some technology in it that is like making it more obsolete as time goes on. That's wild. So like I bought it despite that, not because of that. Um, but I don't know. I just I I have different feelings about like the merging of digital and analog stuff. I think there's a there's a place where it makes sense, but I do think it's easy to make it unnatural, and then it's kind of an uncanny valley where it's not really solving the problem for anybody. It's just adding expense and adding complication with too much compromise. And I think because of that, we have not seen a lot of developments in that way in terms of products in the fountain pen world, nor from talking to our various like manufacturers and stuff, is that stuff like really on the horizon. I feel like it was talked about a little bit more a few years ago. And then it's just like, no, nah, it's not really what it's not really what everybody wants. Like when Parker tried to make that one felt tip pen look oh, like the, a fountain pen the fifth element or something was it technology the or fifth? something like that yeah yeah well i mean that nothing against parker but it really wasn't new technology it was a it was a felt tip pen but that was made to look like a fountain pen but anyway i digress cool all right drew yes got one for you from b hey brian and drew a lot of people Saying hello. Um, all right, a bit of a silly question about a problem that I've struggled with lately, but I'm not sure that anyone else has. Well, I don't think you're the only one with this problem, which is why we're taking the question. Uh, I found that I have trouble writing at a consistent angle with my fountain pens on different heights of journals. I guess like thicknesses of journals, right? Um, whether that be when I just start a new journal, so you have the bulk of it like down and you just have like book flap or whatever, the cover. Um, or you switch to another journal of a different height, page count size, etc. cetera. Uh, for example, the beginning of my A6 360 plus page journal to the middle of my B6 200 plus page journal. Those are some thick journals. Like we carry a bunch of journals, but we don't carry anything that thick. We have gotten requests for some sometimes, but it's it's a very narrow use case for people that want like a 300 plus page journal, um, partly because of 
this very problem. Um, each of these new positions requires a hand adjustment regardless of the pen I use. And as a person with smaller hands who's still learning the correct positioning for fountain pens to write well, it gets tedious. I was wondering whether that is something other people go through or if you had any tips on how to work around it. Sorry if this is unclear and thank you for all that you do. No, not unclear at all. Like that, that's, that I think that we've all had challenges with hand positioning. It's not just something that occurs when you're learning where to put your grip and how to position your hand in relation to your notebook. It's something that occurs whenever you load up a new book into your traveler's notebook or whenever you buy a new journal that you've never used before, you know, a lot of different reasons. It could be, you know, height, meaning thickness of your journal. It could be just just the orientation of the journal size altogether. So no, we've all been there. For me, I find myself challenged most when I don't have a journal that lies completely flat. Mm. So you have a little bit of a hump yeah. there. Mm. And cause I always wanna write, <clears throat> I always wanna write all over my page. So I wanna take up that space, but because it's so annoying to me and I don't wanna have to think about writing on the hump, I just kind of avoid it. So. I'll have the little, even if it's just a modest little hump where the paper folds open, I just kind of avoid it. And I, and I just imagine, oh, really? I just imagine there's an invisible margin there, just like hmm. an old like classroom, you know, uh, page where it have that red line yeah, yeah, where the, the, the paragraph, yeah. Whatever line so I just, I just pretend line. something's there. I just don't deal with it because yeah, like you said, it's, I have to adjust and angle and I, I still have to think about that. You do need to stay conscious of your rotation and angle, but only to a certain point. I don't want to have to deal with it, but so much. So that's a challenge for me. Another challenge I have is when I get to the bottom of the page usually, and my hand is falling off of my notebook. So I go from yeah. resting my hand on my book to resting my hand on my desk or my table. And yeah, I have to correct some things. And usually I see a little skip. I'm like, oh, nope, never mind. And I have to correct for that. And depending on the paper, I, that's, this doesn't happen anymore because I know what papers do this and which papers don't. But sometimes you can also encounter hand oils down at the bottom of the page because that's where your hand has been. So the only paper that I found did this really badly was Cosmo Air Light, mm. which we've never carried. And for this reason, I've kind of avoided it because it just, and I don't have oily hands. I have notoriously dry hands. Like mm. I need to, I need help. But I'm, um, like, I'm on the oily end of the spectrum. Well, even I'm like my super oily person, even my dry hands put oil on Cosmo really? Air Light. Yeah. Mm. So I would get to the bottom and it would just start. I would the getting some skipping. The pen wouldn't dry out, but there would be spots where it just wouldn't put down ink. So that's kind and of it's really like it's really inconsistent too. If you haven't experienced this for yourself, like. It is a different experience than when you have a paper that's just like feathering a lot or really absorbing yeah. the paper. It'll be very inconsistent. So like if you have hand oils on the paper and it's usually with like very, again, very slick, like a, a heavily sized paper. Like um, some people get this with, with Claire Fontaine because Claire Fontaine's some pretty slick paper as well. It's not like a consistent thing that we hear, but it does happen from time to time. Like with Triumph especially, that's really, really slick paper. You can get some hand oil stuff. Um, but uh, you'll, yeah, you'll get it where it's like, it'll write fine for a little bit. And then like parts of a letter or parts of a word will just like, I don't know, it seems like the ink is just like not penetrating. I mean, you know? to me, it, remi it reminds me of when you'd dye eggs for Easter as a kid and you had that white wax yeah. crayon. And then yeah. that would be the parts where the dye would not go. Yeah, I mean, in effect, that's kind of similar to what's happening. Like the oils from your hands, oil and water don't mix. That's like an adage, right? Well, if you have oil on top of the paper and you put water, fountain pen ink over it, it's not going to penetrate that. So it's going to like, you're going to have what looks like a skip or, you know, a little super weak looking line that's like, like barely there. It and was so kind of bad annoying. on Cosmo Air Light that I took and colored it in and I could see my really? the lines from my hand on it. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, it was wow. terrible. Um, oh, but God, I've never had it that bad. What you can do to avoid that is just to simply put a piece of paper under your hand and kind of like mm -hmm. scoot your hand down as you move down to the bottom of your mm -hmm. paper and then, you know, toss it. Yeah. Um, and of course, hmm. that uh, leaves you then with your hand resting on the table. So what do you do there? And mm. if you've got a massive book like what you're using, yeah, you just- 300 pages. That's... You, you just need to, you need to elevate your hand a little bit more. Mm. So you need to find something, you know, maybe this is not your first 300 page notebook and you've got another one laying around. So, hey, hooray for you. You've got something perfectly high uh, to do that with. But I do sometimes do that. If I have a- uh, a thicker journal, which 
Hmm. I don't usually use. I usually use thinner journals, so it's not a big deal for me. But I have, you know, if I know that I'm going to be writing at least a page or two on a thicker journal, then yeah, I can put something hmm. underneath my hand. Sometimes, you know, I'll stack like two A5s or something like that on there to get the job done. But it definitely can help, and it definitely can cut down on the amount of adjustments that you do have to make if you just elevate your hand a little bit there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, keeping all of this in mind, um, I still do, just without height in the book department taking into account, I still do have issues with rotation, and I still do have issues mm-hmm. just the fact that I'm up at the top of the page or I'm at the right or the left or the bottom, I still do struggle with rotation. When we went to the DC Pen Show last year, we had that handwriting um, sample done with Pilot. And I did learn that I rotate a little bit and I'm working on it. And Mm -hmm. I was told by at least one nib specialist that uh, I have a rotation as well. So I try to be better, Mm -hmm. but I mean, I write with fountain pens all the time and I still rotate my grip. So it's something that I'm constantly being aware of Hmm. and it's just kind of it goes with the territory you need to make sure that your grip is the same at all times depending on the type of pen you have as well some Hmm. pens are more prone for me anyway to rotation than others you know depending on what the grip section is like Hmm. so um i would just continue to keep that in mind i know that it's not something you want to have to think about but until you get just completely perfect at hand positioning and you never screw up and you just have a completely static grip, you know, you're going to have to be aware of it. But even a static grip, you're going to have to, you know, you're moving across a page, you're going to have to angle it from time to time. It, it might get automatic one day. For me, it's still not automatic. Yeah. Um, but uh, don't don't feel bad that, you know, you have to readjust. It's just kind of part of the writing experience. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just you're traveling to where your nib wants to be. And um, it's a, it's a two way street, you and your nib on an adventure. Yeah. It's, it's uh, I know this all sounds like a lot and you're like, I'm just trying to write some freaking words. Why yeah. do I have to do all these things? You know, and I totally get that argument. And it's like, if you're just trying to write down something quick, okay. You don't want to have to set up your whole environment and all that kind of stuff. So it's like, you kind of have to gauge how much time you're going to spend and how much you're going to be writing. But it sounds like if you're using journals this thick, you're probably writing a lot. So I really do think it'd be worth taking some time to get like a truly proper setup for you. Um, I think about the the book that we have, um, Michael Saul's book, Art of Cursive Penmanship. Um, I've taken a class with Michael Saul doing some calligraphy and flourishing and I talked with Jake Weidman and other like master penman calligraphers who, you know, it really is like like playing an instrument. Like if you are playing an instrument at like a professional level, you are gonna have very, very specific ways that you set up, that you stand, that you have your position. You know, like I'm relearning saxophone. And I know that if I don't have my saxophone at the right height into my mouth, I'll bite the reed, it'll sound, my tone will be off, all these things. You know, if I'm playing standing versus sitting, it sounds totally different. It's a good analogy. So yeah, like I view a fountain pen as this is where like the writing instrument, it's not, okay, it is a little bit of a marketing buzzwordy kind of a thing because it sounds fancier, but truly if you're writing a lot like this and you want to get like the best writing experience out of it, you have to kind of think of it like playing an instrument. You know, if you're playing piano, your posture, your height that you're sitting, the position of your hands, all that stuff matters a lot. And it matters more the more you play it. You know, same thing with writing. The more you're writing, the more intentional your setup needs to be to be able to do it properly. So it does sound like a lot of work. It's not that much if you kind of like wrap your head around it and then get your setup. And then once you have a really good proper setup, it's going to be that much more enjoyable because you're going to remove all those annoying like little bits of friction. And then you're truly just going to be able to enjoy it. Um, So I think this is much more common in like the dip pen and calligraphy world. Like so much of that is not around necessarily like the tools that are used per se, but it's about the end result of the writing and getting like proper handwriting. So it's tons of practice getting proper setup, proper posture, all that kind of stuff. And then just like repetition, repetition, repetition. But, you know, the reason I mentioned Michael Soule's book, Art of Cursed Penmanship, is he talks in there very specifically about things like the height of your seat, having your knees at a 90 degree bend with your feet flat on the floor and your posture and this and your elbow and here and turning the paper and this like, 
it sounds very specific, but it's all because this has all been figured out already in terms of like the best setup to have to get you the best writing experience, especially for a long period of time that will not fatigue your muscles and that will not, you know, cramp up your hand and all this type of stuff. This has all been figured out. That book and specifically is probably the best one that I know that we have that explains all that stuff um, and tons of other stuff too. So look into that a little bit. If, you know, not to say like it will address this specific like notebook thickness um, just with that, but anybody who's coming over from like the calligraphy world, this is all so normal to them. Like, yeah, having a very specific setup for your writing, that is like just basic. That's that's the first thing you need to figure out. Then it's the practice and getting better and stuff like that. So I would, I would think about it like that maybe a little bit, um, especially if you're writing a lot. And then this is going to sound a little bit extreme. I never really actually thought about this before, but I've seen calligraphers and artists use and this is, again, this is going to sound very extreme, but for anybody who writes a lot, maybe it's worth looking into. If you have the oily hand thing, they actually make a glove specifically to help with this. Um, there's a couple names for it. It can be called an artist glove, a two finger glove, or an anti fouling glove. So it's literally a glove that just covers your two, your pinky and your ring finger. And then it comes down and wraps around your wrist. So these fingers are all open for you to be able to hold your pen. But then these ones, have you know a glove on it so that your hand is not actually touching the page. So if you don't wanna to have to slide another page down and all that, if you're writing like page after page after page, maybe try that glove. I looked online, you can find them kind of at any art store. They're not super expensive. It might feel a little silly, but like any artist or calligrapher, like they're wearing these things and not feeling weird about it. And I feel like I never thought about using that for fountain pens for writing for a long time, but it totally makes sense and would solve any hand oil issues you might have. So maybe try that out. Hmm. I don't know. I'm curious now. I'm like, man, I want to. I want to like get one of those. Should we sell them? Could we brand them? I mean, no could we make them? Could we make them look like a no monster? Ever mo asked for them? Could we make them look like a monster hand or some sort of scaly dragon claw or something? I'm sure you could do whatever yeah. you want with it. But like, I mean, I think about it like when I was learning how to weld. Like for, I literally I use the same kind of thing for TIG welding because when you're TIG welding, you hold the the welding torch in your hand very much like a pen and then you have the filler rod that you have to work with the other hand but the problem is you have to rest your hand on the workpiece that you're working on and it gets really hot when you're welding because it's like almost the temperature of the sun so you actually wear this thing it's, it's called like a tig finger or something like that it's like a heat resistant material that you slide over these two fingers and and it it keeps it from making contact with the metal so that you aren't burning your hand here. And I'm so like, you already have one. This is literally the same concept. And it's like when I'm when I'm TIG welding, I know that I got to wear the setup and do all that because that's that's what I'm trying to do. So it's like, oh yeah, of course. If you're trying to write with fountain pens to the best of your experience, why not throw on a glove? Why not you know have your notebook stacked up and do all? It's like it totally makes sense. Just get your setup to be where it's optimal, and then your experience is going to be the best it can be. So, I don't know. Seems like a lot of work, but it's also kind of it could end up taking it to the next level for you. You probably just also have a thin, you know, knit glove and just chop a couple fingers of it off. Yeah, that's true. You don't have to buy a special glove. You could take any glove that you have and just cut off these <laughs> cut yeah. off these fingers and or just wear the whole glove if you want. You know, that's probably weird, but whatever. You got lots of options here for you. All right, um, we're gonna do a pen spotlight today on an Ian Schoen pen. And it just so happens to be an exclusive pen that we co-designed with Ian. Um, this is our Pocket 6 Bismuth Crystal. Yeah. And we'll be showing that pen, but we'll also be highlighting the Monarch nib. So uh, without further ado, let's show you this thing. All right, All right we're rolling, Ready? Brian. Cool. Show us a thing. Well, we look at here. that. Pocket 6, you wanna talk about a pen that you do not wanna write with unposted. This would be one of them. Yes. Because it's tiny. So this is not the first Pocket 6 that we've had. I mean, look at this. I can't like, I can almost like write with it secretly. Yes. You know, it's like hidden pen. Um, but it does screw onto the back. If you're not familiar with the Pocket 6, it is a pocket pen. This is uh, Ian's design. It's a pretty, you know, it's a decent length pen once you put the, the cap on there. Yes. And it screws on the back, so it's very, very secure. And when um, it's not posted, when it is capped, it is our shortest pen that we sell. Is it the shortest of it all is the pens? Even shorter than the Lilliput. Look at that. I mean, it is a pretty tiny pen. Lilliput's thinner, but this is the shortest. Correct. Uh, but this thing has got a number six nib on it. Heck yeah, it Definitely does. Definitely the smallest pen with a number six nib. Definitely. No question. Uh, so uh, these pens, couple of interesting features. So we've had 
we've had shown pens before, but they've always been smooth. Mm -hmm. We've never had one that's been faceted. So it's not just a crazy pattern. I mean, it's kind of hard to tell because you got a bunch of colors going on and you've got some texture. So these are, you know, one could argue that, is this guilloche? I don't know, Drew. Oh. This is... This is technically I don't know. sort of like a guilloche. I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's done with a machine. It's done with a machine, and it's done in a specific rotational pattern. I don't know. Well, it's a, I'll have to ask Ian about that. He could step up the fanciness of his name. Yeah. Anyway, it's an engraved pattern, not unlike a guilloche, uh, but it uh, you know, just adds to the, the complexity of the pen and the, the craftsmanship, of, craftsmanship of it, which is pretty cool. Now, we've done a couple of collaborations with Ian Schoen uh, before, but boy, he has so many options that you can get custom on his site. So, you know, we don't get a kickback or anything when you buy something directly from him, but just he's a good dude and makes awesome pens and you should check him out. Definitely. Um, hopefully you like the ones that we've picked out. That's great. If you like it, please, you know, buy from us. And, and this color has too. been available from him in the past, from his website. But the great thing is, that every time he runs a batch through um, his anodization process, it comes out a little bit different. So all mm -hmm. the pens that we have are from a batch that he did for us. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be, this bismuth crystal run is going to be different than the bismuth crystal run that he has had previously available on his website. So mm -hmm. it's still more or less going to be the same um, you know, set of colors, but its saturation, yeah. its distribution is all going to be different. And he has said that this happened Look. to be a really, really good batch. It is, they look amazing. And I mean, you get a range of colors between blue, purple, turquoise, yellow, red, and each pen looks pretty different. So they're very, they're gonna be very unique, which in some ways is amazing. In some ways it's like, oh shoot, it's gonna be <laughs> hard to represent these online. But you know, as long as you can be okay with you know, sort of the range of colors. Unfortunately, we can't take special requests because good Lord, how would we even define what color some of these are? So it's kind of like you order and then you get what you get. I mean, I'm just realizing right now my ring like really matches this pen yeah, pretty well. Yeah, it's not bad. Um, but anyway, so you're gonna get something in that range of like, some might be a little more green dominant, some might be a little more purple dominant, but you're gonna get this full range of colors on the whole pen. Um, so really cool pen. It's very short, so it does not take a full-size converter, but it will take a Kaveco mini converter, if you're interested. It takes standard international short cartridges, um, which is what I've done. I've filled mine with um, a short cartridge, and that gets you pretty adequate ink. Um, and the pen seals really well, too. Um, you yeah, it's know, got O-rings. Yeah, it's got O-rings on here, so if you are wanting to seal it up, um, you know, you can see that O-ring in there. It's a good, good O-ring, too. So, um, when you screw it down, you can feel a little bit of resistance there. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, locks in nice and tight. The machining is amazing. Craftsmanship, you can tell, is just very, very precise. Um, yeah. And these really are, really cool I think, pen. around 265, if I'm not mistaken. They've got a Yovo steel nib on them. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want to go up into the $600 range. Yes. So it seems a little crazy. You're like, oh, if you upgrade to the Monarch nib, the pen more than doubles in price. Well, that's why we needed to really show you what's going on. So... If you get the, um, let me set these aside before it get too crowded. If you get the Monarch nib, first off, you get this fancy little Monarch nib cleaning system. It's just an ink syringe that you put on the back of the nib and then you can use it to flush it out. Not unlike a bulb syringe, which you can also use. But anyway, Ian includes that. Um, here's the pen. The Monarch nib needs a little bit of splain in. That's right. Because it's got cool stuff going gosh look at that pen oh i like the blue like mm. too mm. so you've already heard a little bit about the monarch nib from ian and we'll make sure mm -hmm. that uh, we link to ian's video specifically on the monarch mm -hmm. nib here as well and you can find it on the product page of our monarch nib and i'll show you the difference between the standard nib and the monarch nib side by side because that might not be easy to tell so the monarch nib definitely looks different it's shown branded so shown is he's making these nibs himself and it's not just the nib, it's the whole nib unit system. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna take it out and I'll show you what is going on there um, because that is part of it. That's part of what makes it so unique. So it's machined out of solid titanium. That's right. Um, and then it's got tipping as well. I don't know, is it tip? The it's tipping not is tipped. not titanium. It's, it's not, not tipped, so it is titanium mm -hmm. through and through. That's right. So when you remove the nib unit, which you can just unscrew it out of there, look at that. That the is the Monarch unit, nib. 
the this is the whole nib. The whole thing is machined out of one solid piece of titanium, which is very unique. I don't know that that's ever been done. Heck no, that's fascinating. Um, it's really, really cool. And then the feed in there is not just any old plastic. It is Ultim, which BK has explained what Ultim is better than I probably ever could. Yeah, and there's really, you know, if you ask, you know, just to kind of get this out of the way, if you ask Ian why people should buy this, he doesn't say you should. He, he, he doesn't try to hard <laughs> sell you cool, one. It's cool, basically. That's it. That is it. That, is, that is completely it. It's innovative. I'm not going to say that it's like solving a lot of problems no, that and, can't be solved in any other way. And neither will he. He, yeah. he said to me that, well, he gets asked that question a lot. And he said, mm -hmm. well, you know, you don't need any fountain pen. And <laughs> how and, many times do I say that? Yeah, exactly. It's like, well, none of us. Need yeah. It. So it's, this is just one of those things. If you yeah. find it fascinating, if you have, or if you're a fountain pen enthusiast and mm -hmm. you have seen a thousand nibs and a thousand feeds, this is going to shock you. This is going to be yeah, this novel is, this and is innovative else. and fun. And that's yeah. why he made it because it's mm -hmm. just fun and interesting and new and unique. And it just looks really cool too. And it also works phenomenally yeah. well because you've got one single unit. I was going to say, let me unscrew, I'll sh unscrew the regular housing so you can see. Oh, Usually you have to deal with a nib working together well with the feed, which are both inserted into a housing unit. So all three items need to be set well together for everything to work. Ian has manufactured yeah. something that he controls its, you know, how things are set and in relation to each other. So yeah, he so gets here. to make sure that that is tuned <sighs> perfectly. Yeah. So typically you have the nib and the feed. They're all separate pieces. Um, and that's fine. Like this is the setup for most fountain pens. And it works. Absolutely it works. Um, it's Yovo, so it's going to work quite well. Um, but the Monarch nib is a totally different beast. I've never tried to actually pull the knit, the feed out of this thing. I don't know. I don't think I you're supposed it, to. I don't think you're supposed to either, nor would you really have a need to. But, no. um, and then just so you can see what's going on, this little cleaning part, this, you can have this installed on the pen, or if you want to get your fingers all linky, you can take it out, but it basically just fits on the back there and then you can, you know, flush it. That's how that works. Flush it quickly. Yes. Um, anyway, um, so I believe that Ian makes these in a fine and a medium nib. We just have the medium nibs. Correct. Because we got very few of these in hand um, because I think we're the first retailer, the first non-shown seller to have the Monarch nibs. Yes. So we were, we were like, this is just really cool. We'd just love to be able to offer it. To those and, that want and just it. to talk about it. Like it's yeah, just, it's, really it's something we've been wanting to talk about for a long time. Brian bought one a couple of years ago. It's been interesting and fun. And it's just not something we really wanted to like talk a lot about since we can't offer them, but it's definitely worthy of being talked about because there's just no one else doing this, especially not in the United States. And yeah, Ian really is cool. a, is a small, small maker. And the fact that um, someone in the U S is making their own nib and feed Mm -hmm. is just extremely rare. So now I get to do a little bit of flexing here because this is before we knew that we were even doing the collaboration uh, with Ian. This is the pen that we bought last year at the DC Pen Show. Same faceted thing because we were like, oh, this is really All right. cool. It wasn't a couple of years ago. I was mistaken. Was it Was it last year or was it two years ago? I can't remember. Maybe it was last year. I think it was just last year. I don't think it's been that okay. long. Yeah. Um, but anyway, same, same design. Pocket 6 has got more of an ombre kind of finish to it. But this one has... The Monarch nib. This one has got a, what is it, iridium, kind of like rainbow tone finish. I forget what he calls this I don't know finish. what he calls it. Um, but this was like, he had like a handful of these. And yeah. it was like, this is just really cool. So we bought it. It's just the finish that's on there. It's still titanium, still the same deal. Um, but I already had this one inked up. So, you know, I didn't want to go inking up somebody else's pen if I didn't have to. So, But this is a medium Monarch nib. So I thought I could just show you all how it writes. That way you can kind of see. This has my go-to ink of um, Robert Oster Blue Water Ice. Um, so you can see it's got the, the nib um, kind of turns up a little bit there. So it's very comfortable, right? Even at a very low angle, um, but at a higher angle, it'll be comfortable too. Um, it's very rounded, very smooth. Flow is good, flow is consistent. Again, I don't know whether Ultim is necessarily a better or worse material for a feed than your typical plastic, like ABS plastic that's used on most feeds, but it sure works great on this pen. Um, I believe Ultima is, is known more for its like heat resistance and like crack resistance and stuff, which I don't know that that matters in terms of a fountain pen setup. It's a pretty stiff nib. But yeah, it's not, 
Yeah, that's true. The titanium nibs that you might see on other brands usually are associated with some sort of like flex. Because they're very thin. Yeah. This one is not thin. No, it's not thin at all. So don't don't buy it thinking you're going to get line variation and stuff like that. In fact, even when I write with some heavier pressure, so like if I go light pressure, heavy pressure, like I get a little bit of line variation, but no more than your average steel nib. No, it's pretty rigid, but it's also really, really consistent. And it's very smooth. Like it feels really good, especially for a medium nib. This feels really, really good. Um, and then he specifically polishes them to be really good at all angles. So it's very rounded. And then writing with it reversed um, is pretty good too. So if I like hold it lower, it's going to write really thin. If I hold it higher up, it gets a little thicker. So, you know, we've gotten that question a few times on the pencast. It's like, why is everybody flipping their nibs over all the time? Well, I'm doing it this one because it can. It's kind of made to be done that way. Yeah. So. On the fine nib, I don't really know why you would want to do it so much, but on the medium, it's kind of nice because if you're using some really thin paper or whatever and you just want to write a few words that don't bleed very much, you can get a pretty thin line on that reversed. And it actually feels good, like you can't you can't hear it scratching or anything like that. Um, so I know he's kind of, kind of polishing it up to be done specifically like that. So there you go. I really can't write and talk at the same time, right. so you're just seeing scribbles, but... Well, it's, it's very a, smooth. Yeah, very fascinating. And, and, and the flow is really wet too. Like this is yeah. putting down a, a lot of ink. So yeah. really good for like shimmering, shading inks. Um, I think it'd be really good for that. And again, my favorite thing about this, and you know, we can be done with a demo, but mm -hmm. there are only a few in the world, pa fountain pen manufacturers that manufacture their own nibs and feeds. Oh yeah, and, it's really hard to do. And all of them are massive. <laughs> like, you know, like big old legacy companies. Oh, not like the nibs themselves are no, massive. No, 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 the like companies. The, the companies you know. are long established. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like, and mm -hmm. I don't think there's any company in the United States that does this other than Ian Schoen. Um, That's making... Nibs and feeds. Nibs and feeds? No, I know... Um, who is it? Is it Tim McKenzie that makes the feeds? Or is he just doing the resins? I'm, I'm trying to remember. I don't know. Didn't you have a, a, a feed done for your one of your pilot pens? Like oh, a custom feed done? Yeah, that was not McKenzie. That was Custom Nib Factory. Custom I, Nib Factory. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I don't um, actually know what country they're in. Okay. I thought there was somebody in the U.S. that was making feeds, but not making nibs. So it's tough. Like yeah. nibs are tough. That is, I mean, that is the heart and soul of what makes a fountain pen a fountain pen. So there like, are, you screw that up and you might as well just leave yeah. the industry <laughs> there are companies that have been trying for years to perfect their nibs it's tough and ian has done it and done it well he doesn't uh he doesn't put out a, an unfinished or half finished product you know yeah he, he will put them out slowly yep and not and they'll be expensive yep <laughs> but they're cool so again not trying to hard sell you on these at all but we just mostly wanted to document it because it's like, this is a cool thing. It's fun for us because we've been selling pens for a long time and we don't always see like totally new things come through. And this, there's a lot of new stuff happening with this pen that we think is really cool. So if you like some of what's going on here, check it out. It is like a single batch that we did. So once these are gone, we're not gonna have this color again. Um, if it sells well and if he ends up for it, I'm sure we'll collaborate on something in the future. We would like to, but um, nothing in life is guaranteed. So, you know, it's a kind of thing that like, if if you're interested in this, it's definitely a lot to save up for, especially with the Monarch nib. You know, you, you gotta do what's practical for you, but don't wait too long because they will not be around forever. We got Ian Schoen, who's got a little segment here. So, uh, what do you say we drop that in here, Drew? And then yes. we'll come back in a few minutes. Let's talk to Ian. He's always a delight. Hey, Pencast. It's me, Ian Schoen of Schoen Design. Welcome back to the studio. Thank you so much to Drew and Brian uh, for having me. We'll start off with a quick tour of the studio. We got only one machine running today. We're running feeds. I've got a little production to do in the afternoon of some new projects and some things that uh, we're a little behind on, um, but only one running for now because I wanted it to be kind of quiet while we do this video. We got our stock rack back here. That's where all of our raw materials are for our pocket sixes, feeds, nibs, full-size pens, everything's there. Aluminum, brass, copper, titanium, stainless steel, Ultem, um, so much over there. And in, my, in the background, you see all of our production machines. Um, and yeah, it's, it's awesome to be in this space. I love what I do. And uh, thank you all for supporting me and thanks to the, 
the Goulet brand for collaborating with me. It means a lot to me uh, and it's been really great uh, getting this work out through the uh, Goulet pen, pen company. So anyways, Drew asks, how do you balance your inner creative visionary with your business pragmatism while taking design and production risks like the Monarch nib? And I think this is a fantastic question. So I'm gonna dive right in. I like to think of our work at the intersection of feasibility, viability, and desirability. And this is something I take from my background in product design and development consulting back in the day. That's something we used to always say for our client work. But for me, it's like, I know what I wanna make and I know what my customers beg me to make when I go to all the pen shows or I get emails from people, they say, you gotta do this. So I hear those things and I catalog them and I know what's in my heart and what I really wanna produce. And then I think about what machines are in the shop? What are their capabilities? And then of course, at the end of the day, I've gotta calculate how, how we make money, how we continue to stay afloat. But oftentimes I'll like come up with a design that is just like so radical. And the Monarch was one of those designs. It came back, came out a long time ago, um, or it was designed a long time ago, but it was way past my capability to make it. So when we, bought, when we bought some new equipment, I knew it was finally time that I could start to stretch. And I said, I think we can do that with this machine and that machine and this fixture and that jig, we can start to make this style apart. And the first versions of that design were way too ambitious, naturally. And I started to have to scale back those features and if we had a design team with a designer and an engineer and a business person and a machinist and a setup guy, you know, the designer and the engineer would be stomping their feet, screaming in the meetings, throwing papers in the air, being really upset that we were defeaturing the Monarch. But, you know, we have to make it at the end of the day. So I decided, okay, if I'm the engineer and I'm the machinist and I'm the designer, there isn't that battle between the engineers, the designers, and the manufacturers to get it done, I just look at it from a, pra a practical approach. So I say, okay, yeah, of course we wanna make a solid gold monarch out of a gold bar and machine the thing, um, but it's not practical. We can't get gold bars like that. And we can't, that, that's, that's impractical. We're gonna make it out of titanium because titanium is cool and it's a neat material. So it's kind of like, I would say my approach is trying to wear all those hats and be empathetic to those sides of the process as I do the design work so that it ships. And when I mean it ships, I want the product to finish, to be done. Because there's a lot of projects that you start them on paper, you make a CAD model, you make a rendering, you show it off, you get really excited about it, but it never comes to fruition. And that's, that's gutting as a designer. That's so hard because either you couldn't produce it or you couldn't justify spending the money to produce it. But for me, if I design within the realm of what I know my machines can produce and what I know I can afford to do and processes that I'm kind of comfortable with and some that are on the edge of what I'm comfortable with, we can find the right balance. So the Monarch was something that was right on the edge and I started looking at it and I said, oh, if we change this and we, we approach it this way and I get this new machine and I build this fixture and this jig and maybe we introduce another manufacturing process, we can put those together and make something really incredible. And I. I, I looked at it from those constraints, from the manufacturing and design perspective, and I said, you know what? I'm happy with that as like the product designer, as the aesthetic designer, and I can make this work. So I started making new versions of the Monarch that kind of fit into what I knew we could do in the shop and we were just outside of the edge, and that's how it really came together. So it's that balance, and it's, it's you know, I'm passionate about it and it really tears me up because like there's a lot that you can do. You can do anything if you set your mind to it. You can really make crazy stuff when it comes to manufacturing and pens. But like, we really have to be careful that we don't do projects that put us out. And this was one of those projects that was right on that hairy edge. So now that we know that we can do this, I've been able to apply all the learnings for our feed manufacturing, our nib manufacturing, our polishing, our nib grinding, all that process for the Monarch I've been able to take that and apply it to future projects, which we've been working super hard on. And I'm really excited to show off what we have uh, for the future uh, based on all of our learnings from this product. So really exciting time, uh, great question. Drew also asks, what is the meaning of the Monarch name? Now, Monarch is a French word. Well, it was, <laughs> Monarch isn't a French word. Monarch is a name we came up with that's based on the word monocoque. Now, monocoque is a French word for single shell. It's used in like car racing and aircraft, aerospace stuff where you have like 
a single bodied airplane or racing car that is also the external body is also the structure or the frame of the airplane or the car. So I thought that was really cool because the housing and the nib are integrated in this design, which is very unique and makes a single bodied shell, which is both aesthetic, functional, structural, it's all those things in one. So I thought, hmm, this kind of suits it and it's new and it's unique and it, it ha it's got a little ring to it. It's, it's zazi -za, za -za, you know? So I was like, you know what, ship it. Uh, at first I was gonna call it the monocoque nib and I was like, no. Let's call it the Monarch. Let's make something. Let's make something interesting. It's it's hard. Naming products is really hard. If any of you out there have ever named a product or tried to name some artwork or something you're working on, it it is extremely difficult. So uh, shout out to you. Anyways, that's how that's how the Monarch name came to be. The next question Drew posed for the PenCast is: The facets on your Pocket Six look symmetrical at first, then they look random, and then they kind of look like maybe there's a pattern. Are they chaos, or are they order? Fantastic question, Drew. So um, we used to have a machine that would sit way back in that corner. That was my first machine that we bought in the shop. And it had an indexer that had 24 positions, 15 degrees per position. And when I was designing this pen, I knew I wanted a texture. So at first I looked at ribs and ridges and grooves. And then I started to be like, what if I could kind of stipple or dot or create like little facets and I was working under the constraints of knowing I could only rotate the part 24 times within the machine that I had without buying new equipment. So it was a nice constraint to have that 24 position indexer because it really said, hey, this is the way you're gonna have to rotate this part while you're milling all those features to get this texture. And I knew I wanted a cool texture. So I came up with some very simple repeating patterns, but they felt, I wouldn't say boring. They just felt simple, too simple and they didn't have enough like life to them. So I started to try and introduce a little irregularity into the pattern to get that, you know, that, that like disco ball effect where it kind of gives you a, a little bit of light coming from a couple different angles. And what I discovered is if you stagger the patterns a specific way and you sit down with it, and I kind of, I kind of brute, forced, brute forced this, to be honest, I sat down and I really designed a lot of different versions until I found one that was just right, which, which is tough. And I was like, I think this is it set it up on the machine, programmed it, came up with a really cool macro because that machine also was, was very old. It was from 1991 and you had to program it within like, I think I only had like 3,600 characters to program that, that pen. So I had to be really clever of how I wrote the macros of how to program the end mill to make that pattern. But again, it was that intersection of what machines do we have? Is it feasible? We know it's feasible, the machine's right there. Is it viable? Can we produce it for the right amount of money? How long does it take to run the parts? How long does it take to finish and clean afterwards? Um, you know, how long does it take to anodize? So it was that right at that intersection. And it's that project was very similar to the Monarch and it really stretched me. But um, I don't know, I kind of fell in love with that design. I have one in my pocket that I've been carrying since I released that pen. I've got the brass one. Uh, it's got a Monarch in it, of course, of course. Um, <laughs> and anyways, that, that project, uh, was a really cool one. So to answer your question, Drew, is it random? No, it's actually extremely intentional, uh, but it's designed to feel a little bit more organic than just a straight pattern. Um, so wonderful question. Anyways, I don't wanna take up too much time. Thanks for having me on the PenCast. Thank you for visiting me in my workshop today, right here in Philadelphia. Um, super excited to share all of our fun things we have going on soon. Thank you all for, uh, I don't know, following along, check out me, check out my Instagram, check out me, check out my Instagram at shown design, shown underscore DSGN. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks again to Brian and Drew for having me on here. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Ian. Good to have you. Wherever you, you, you are right now at this right. moment. He's in Pennsylvania. Yes, <laughs> he's charming, he's fascinating, he's fun, he's insightful. And I think the Fountain Pen community is at least a little bit better for having him in it. Yeah, he's a special, special person in, in this industry. So glad to be able to support him. He certainly doesn't have any fear of innovating and getting clever with his design. So, um, yeah, glad we were able to show it this time. And uh, that's our spotlight. And I think we can now move on to what's happening. That we can. All right. Um, well, 
I don't have quite as much to cover because I was not uh, off last week, but yeah. I did have a pretty exciting weekend. Um, did you know? Yeah, it was just busy the whole time, but it wasn't like exhausting. I still felt like it was mm. relaxing and fun. So Friday night, we did go over a friend's house for a birthday celebration, which was cool. pleasant. Cool. Um, just had some uh, some dinner mm -hmm. and saw some friends. Uh, and then Saturday, I woke up and started making cupcakes for... My son's kind of, we we went to Disney, you know, around his birthday and we got him plenty of stuff. So he's not wanting for anything, but he never did get to have friends over. And you know, that's a big part of kid's birthday. So he still wanted to have some friends over. So here we are two months removed from his birthday and he still wanted some friends over. So we got that, I got cool. a couple friends over, just three other kids, but he had a good time. And uh, I did want to give him a special dessert, even though it wasn't his birthday anymore, I let him pick. And originally mm -hmm. he wanted emoji cupcakes. And I'm like, oh, okay, I can figure that out. Hmm. And then later I found out he really only cared about the turret emoji cupcake. So <laughs> the way I- I feel like that's the easiest to do on a cupcake because you just like swirl it on the exactly. top, right? Exactly. Yeah. So in my opinion, I'm like, oh, well, I could just do those. I mean, there's gonna be a lot of frosting though. Yeah, I didn't buy enough frosting, but <laughs> there was only three other kids, so it was fine. Oh, um, so I bought some candy eyes and, uh, you know, made some Tur turd cupcakes certified yep. cupcakes That's so fun. i woke up you know just had a you know some you know whatever duncan hines cake mix or whatever you know sure bake some cupcakes put some icing on them slap some eyes on there boom he was thrilled nailed it he loved it so that's the best when you have a parenting thing that's like your kid just friggin' loves it and like wasn't that hard to do no no i was really good like how many things have you done i mean some of your halloween costumes and stuff i know they've gone over well but like the amount of time that you invest into some of these things doing stuff for your kids and then it's you're just like boy i hope they appreciate this at all yeah, well or like a vacation or something like that and you're just like Phew. i i happen to be the son of somebody um and uh, so i do know you? i really? know i know from experience <laughs> that uh He's not going to appreciate it until he's in his 30s. Mm. And you know what? That's okay. Yeah. That's okay. He'll get there. That's why you take pictures. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you can remember it. <laughs> He'll get there. Yep. So yeah. all good. He was actually really appreciative when I, I picked him up from his after school program yesterday to see the eclipse. He was just like, you know, Ted, thank you so much for doing this. I just, I don't think everybody would do this, but I really appreciate it. I'm like, oh my gosh. Well, wow. You're welcome. What Great. A courteous kid. Yeah. I was like, hmm. That's, he's been less courteous about more impactful things I've done for him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. well, the, the radar is not going to be finely tuned. Right, but and that's fine. I'll, I'll take it. I was like, yeah, thank you. I really appreciate that. That's, so anyway, that went funny. over well. The kids were great. Um, it was nice to observe him with other kids. That's not something I'm able to do. Like you right. have siblings, you know, uh, in your home. So Yeah, but that's... You could that's see, a very specific dynamic. Right. That I don't out. see any dynamic. You know, yeah, I don't see him with any other kids. Well, you've so. got like his friends that he gets together with, but. Every now and then, but I'm not, I usually, like he'll have like one kid over, yeah. you know, every now and then. Yeah. Okay. But in a group, I've never really kind of witnessed yeah. like, well, how does he, Interesting. what role yeah. does he play? And I was actually really proud of him. He, you know, they were arguing about like, so they had four kids and three switch controllers, right? So they couldn't all play together they either had oh, to have yeah. one person out and you know everybody was arguing arch was like hey hang on hang on how about we just have two people playing at a time so two people on two people off that way no one person is you know singled out hmm. and i'm like i'm just listening i'm like okay okay that? it was chaos and madness until that point i'm like okay so overall like he was still acting like a fool and like yeah, yelling at people hit a hit a no a a a i'm like dude I'm not, I'm not saying anything. I'm just letting it play out. But yeah. in my head, I'm like, that's, that, so that's not helpful. Yeah. But overall, listening, he was more of a part of the solution than he was a part of the problem. So I'll take it. Well, that's encouraging. Yeah. <laughs> so I was happy overall. Um, I feel and like we, then, can all, uh, we can all swing the pendulum. Absolutely, we can. One way or the other. Absolutely, we can. I've been part of the problem plenty of times. Mm. Um, and then let's see. So that was a pretty solid day. I ended the day watching WrestleMania night one. More on that later. Okay. Uh, oh. And then mm. Sunday, we took a day trip to Yorktown. So we went to oh. the American Revolution Museum. We ate at Food for Thought, of course. Nice. And Trump then, and you know it. Do you get anything else? At that no, why, why would, would I? Why would you? The yeah. only time I've gotten something different there is when I've gone there like within the same month. And I'm like, okay, you know what? I have had that kind of recently. Mm. They have other good stuff. Yeah. Um, I'll do that every now and I'm definitely like, if I go to a restaurant and I find the thing I like, I lock it in and I go there. Like I pick a restaurant thinking of the meal I'm going to get there. 
not like, oh, I will just try something random because then I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to get. Yeah. I don't know what I like. I was really happy this time. They said, you know, mild, medium, or extra spicy. I'm like, extra spicy. I was like, thank you, extra spicy. So not just spicy. They no, just I had, I've had cranked to, it up to 11. I've had to ask for extra spicy before. Hmm. You know, I'm like, come on, y'all. Don't, don't. Because I think m- people must have complained because they do put jalapenos in it. But oh, uh, okay. yeah, so I was happy with that. That was great. Uh, we visited uh, the York River beach side. Just kind of like let Shannon feel the wind and see the water. She is mm-hmm. one of those people that when she gets to mm. be, gets at a shoreline, she is like, yeah, that is, that infuses people, her with like life. That. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, it's like a, it's, it's like a form of grounding. It really is. You know, it's just like being near water. hundred percent. Some people just like fills them up. That's yeah. her. That cool. is a hundred percent. We weren't there for long, but it was enough for her to absorb it. And hmm. she takes a lot from that. So, interesting. um, yeah, that was nice. We stopped by, um, the outlets for a little bit. I picked up some Converse all-stars for my brother and cause he's never had them, but he tried on some of mine recently. He was like, Oh, I didn't think I would like these, but these are actually really good. So I found some on clearance, and if he doesn't like them, I'll keep them. Huh. So did that. The same size? Uh, yeah, appro- approximately. Uh, close enough, yeah. Okay. Converse, you can kind of go up or down a half size easily on those. Yeah. Um, and then WrestleMania Night 2. So haven't watched a WrestleMania in probably, let's see, whenever, whatever, 2000. Three, maybe 2004. <laughs> wow, it's been a long time. It's a minute ago, but I have been a part of a much larger swath of people that have gotten back into pro wrestling recently. Oh, interesting. What something has happened where they've switched around some people that you know do their storylines and stuff like that, that they mm. have attracted or reattracted some people. Interesting, like you've seen you know people getting more late night interviews and stuff like that that like didn't used to get that level of press obviously the mm-hmm. rock coming back has a lot to do with it but man oh the rock is back to wrestling again he is really yep i mean it's not total shock but like but no he is and he's huh it was funny because he inserted himself into the storyline is he a, like the rock character oh, like back to his he, old he wasn't at first so he, i mean come on he showed like he showed up kind of took over said like okay actually i'm gonna be in wrestlemania not this other guy that they've been working the storyline with but the fans just went nuts and of started course. hating on him. So they were like, yeah, okay, you know what? Yeah, because he was like the, there's like different characters, right? Like the heroes and the- Yeah, whatever, the heels and faces. Okay, yep. yeah, that's what it's called. That's what it's called. So they pivoted and they're like, okay, you know what? Let's just have The Rock go full heel. And Smell he did the rock is cooking. 100%. He came out, he comes out, just whatever city they were in, he's like oh calling gosh. them all trailer trash and like wearing his old- calling like jabronis like, absolutely. and all that kind of stuff. He just went full heel heel oh, and it was man. glorious it had to be so fun for him oh though. i'm like, sure i'm sure <laughs> but ever since that happened like it's just kind of like shifted and it kind of feels like the way it was kind of in its heyday in the late 90s early 2000s huh and so this two-night wrestlemania event he was in it the main the good guy cody rhodes was in it he got to do his thing and it was like it reminded me like honestly the storytelling was shockingly good hmm. like we're talking like a storyline that had a callback from like 10 years ago. Wow. And I was like, this is extremely entertaining. <laughs> and I, yeah, I loved it uh, both nights. It was it was absolutely fascinating. And I was just on the edge of my seat. And I am still shocked that I am as into it as I am, but I am fully in. I mean, it sounds like that's been, I still don't, it's I, been dormant. They're just waiting to get relit. I think so. You know? Like it was one thing, because normally I don't stop liking things. Yeah. You know, I just like them forever. Yeah. But this was kind of like the one thing that I'm like, yeah, I kind of lost interest in it. Mm-hmm. But now I'm like, oh, well, okay, I guess not. I mean, I feel like as millennials are entering into middle age here, yeah. we're just like ripe for nostalgia. Like just movies, video games, yeah. pop culture, fashion, yep. all of it. Just bring the 90s back. 100%. We're soaking it in. Yeah. Why not? Yep. The, the, the Rock was calling himself the final boss this whole time, you know, saying like, you know, I'm coming in, I'm the final boss, I'm the final boss. Mm-hmm. And like during this thing, he came in and it looked like it was he was going to ruin it for the good guy, right? And then you hear this bell, which is obviously the Undertaker's oh theme song. Gosh. And all the lights go down. And all of a sudden, the freaking Undertaker's standing right there behind him. And he turns around and he grabs him <laughs> by the throat, slams him down. The lights go back out. And then he and The Rock are both just gone. <laughs> and you're like, what the heck just happened? What year is it? That's pretty and cool. And yeah, it was like this 
he was like the ghost of WrestleMania showing up and <laughs> casting him aside. Get out of here, buddy. It's wild. It was wild. It That's was crazy. Wild. So anyway, that was a that was a barrel of monkeys. And then wow. um, I started my seeds. So got some tomato seeds planted, yeah. a couple herbs. Um, so those are rolling. A little bit of a later start, but that's fine because last year our cold weather kind of extended past the last frost date in our region. Right, right. So it's fine. They're not gonna. They're not I gonna think go we anywhere. technically still haven't reached our last frost date. No, it's the seventeenth. But I'm like, it's freaking like eighty degrees almost today. Can't trust it. Like, you know Virginia. You can't trust Virginia. I know. It's, like last week, was it could cold it and could gross. snow. It could snow tomorrow for all we know. No. Um. So uh, yeah, those are those are working. I've I'm, I've planted some uh, purple bumblebee carrots again. Have done done those before. Those are fun. And then mm. this time I did some black strawberry carrots, which are um, hmm. weird. They're like purple and yellow. I don't know how they're gonna taste. I don't even know how big they're gonna be. But anyway, planted them. Hmm. And then kind of the standard big beef tomatoes, which I always do well with. Those I mean, always you know classic. Uh, we finished watching Fargo season five with um, mm. John Hamm. Uh, and, uh, you know, okay. I'm like, who else is in that? Anyway, it was great, great season. All the Fargo seasons are fantastic. Hmm. And now we've moved on, moved on to, uh, we reactivated Hulu for that because we had, ca- we had canceled that one cause we don't want, but so many subscriptions. Right. So we woke Hulu back up because we wanted to watch Fargo and Shogun. So we're, uh, hmm. now moved on to Shogun, which is, uh, so far a little confusing politically, but we're in the third episode now and things are starting to kind of make a little bit more sense. Okay. Very well produced show, you know, mm. big beautiful sets and yeah. Solid, but uh yeah. Mm. That's about it for me. Neat. Moving on. Yeah. I mean, so I was out. I don't know that I have like two full weeks worth of entertaining stuff to talk about because you know, our kids were off for spring break. We went and visited family. So I did a lot of family stuff, yeah. hanging with my niece and nephews, doing kid stuff, helping my in-laws around the house. Nothing too crazy, because everybody likes a couple of people are sick. And you know, kind of the whole thing when you get like 10 people in the family and it's like the stars have to align to get everybody to do something. Oh together. yeah. But we had lots of like meals together and just mostly lots of just like chilling. It was like half the time we were there was like cold and rainy and gross. So we weren't like super excited about going to a lot of places. Um, and they live in like the DC metro area. So it, I originally talked about like, hey, we should go to like the Smithsonian museums and like check out some history stuff because now my kids are old enough where they actually know some history things yeah. and could appreciate some of that. It just didn't happen. Between the bad weather, my brother-in-law ended up having like a work retreat thing. So he was gone like Thursday, Friday. So like the days the weather was nice, he wouldn't have been able to come in uh. and to like drive to the park and ride, take the Metro, go into DC, walk around the cities, all that with like four kids, you know, and my niece and nephew can be a bit of a handful sometimes, especially in like strange places. And, you know, Rachel's sister wasn't really feeling that great. Her mom wasn't feeling great. So it was like, I don't know if I can shoulder like the four kids around the whole thing, like solo. Oh God, no. A strange city. I'm navigationally challenged myself anyway. And DC is a very confusing city to walk around in. Um, So, you know what? We were just like, yeah, we'll just go to like a trampoline park one afternoon and then just sort of hang out and do Legos and play video games. When you're up there, do do y'all usually just eat in or do y'all ever go to restaurants? So we usually get takeout. Yeah. Because like to, especially like you go out to a restaurant with 10 people. That's a lot. You're not getting to talk to everybody anyway. Heck no. So, and you four know, kids. Four Ooh. kids and everybody's, you know, her kids are younger too. So they've got all their weird preferences and they will only eat something if it's in that such a form and cut up a certain way. And, and it's just like, all right, we're just, yeah. you know what? Let's just bring food in. Yeah. Is That's there a place easier. up there that you don't get down here? Oh, there's so many restaurant options That's in the DC stuff? area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing like crazy, but no. we got Silver Diner takeout one time. That's oh, always okay. a that's always a hit. Yeah. Um, what else did we have? Baja Fresh. We don't have that down here. That's right. Yeah. yeah it's like I've never fast, been to one of those. Fast casual Tex Mex type of thing, but it's really good. They have lots so, of salsa options. Um, yeah. So I'm usually like the food runner when I go up there. You know, me and my me and my brother in law will often go and like listen to the music that no one else in the family likes. You know, we'll just be blasting deathcore metal or some kind of techno you know euro techno stuff nice. we have a very eclectic mix of music tastes but him and i are pretty aligned in that way so that was fun um got to play lots of saxophone brought my sax up oh, there oh cool so yeah i was like i'm gonna have a lot of downtime and the weather was gonna be gross so i was like why not did you go to like saxophone? a closet or something or 
Um, I wasn't relegated to a closet. I was like in a guest room, or like okay. a bedroom, you know, which felt it was weird because I told Rachel, I was like, literally, this is only the second time since I've started playing saxophone that it's been not in my closet. That's not to so say, I've like, been, don't you normally play in a closet? Yeah, yeah, every day. So I'm, I'm keeping track of my hours still. How, how, what, what sounds better, a guest room or a closet? Oh, it's different. Yeah. So the, it sounds louder, uh, when I'm not in the closet. Because the closet, I have all my clothes up, which oh. absorb the sound. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Baffles. Yeah. Um, so it, it sounded very different. It like reverberated more and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, but I don't know. It was different. It both sounded, I mean, it sounded great no matter where I played because, of course. you know, whatever. No, but like I'm, I'm practicing with regularity. I've been practicing a lot of like, you know, fundamental exercises and stuff like that and getting – getting it back i'm getting my tone back i'm getting getting my, your groove back I'm getting my groove back that's a right bit. but it's interesting because like i played saxophone in college but i i was in a military marching band i previous like i grew up playing clarinet and then bass clarinet contrabass clarinet so when i switched to tenor saxophone it was purely to march it and so all i really played was like military marching hymns and stuff like that Yay! you know star spangled banner and uh-huh. national emblem and that type of stuff and then I did the jazz band for like one semester with the Barry sax, which was rough because first off, it's in a different key than everything else I'd ever played. It's in E flat instead of B flat, if you care about that. So it just sounds different. And it's bass clef instead of treble clef. So like all the notes and the lines are totally different. So I basically had to like, okay, what note is that and which finger position is that? So like I never really got good at it. Uh, so now I'm like actually getting to the point where I'm practicing and I feel like I'm playing better than I was back in college How about after that? about six months That's of a milestone. Yeah, it's kind of cool. I mean, I my memory could be way off Well, even, that, even the fact that you're close is a milestone. Yeah, I like, feel like I'm, I'm definitely playing more interesting stuff. Because when you started, you're like, oh man, I hope, you know, it's going to be a well while until I'm as good as I used to be. Yeah, because like, now you're I would there play, or I would maybe play and I'd like run out of breath and like not be able to complete a whole phrase. And now I'm like, I can play it and nice. I'm, you know, I'm like able to sight read better and I'm able to. I like, like to think that the deep dives in the pen cast have probably helped you with your lung capacity. Oh, probably. Yeah. yeah just lots and lots of talking. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You know, definitely. <laughs> but no, I mean, it's fun. I'm having a blast with it. Um, yeah. And I'm like, uh, I'll see. I think I'm, I think I'm at like 40, 48 hours now of practice. That's almost halfway. Tracking. Almost halfway. Nice. So I'm on track for like late June. At this point, if I keep up, I'm averaging like 40 minutes a day of practice. And that's when Barry's going to move in. Yeah, Barry Manilow. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I will have to figure that out. So I'm still shopping around, still seeing, seeing what my options are, but I'm not rushing it, you know? Honestly, I might get to the goal and be like, okay, I achieved that, but I'm like, I'm still not ready to buy it. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just not, it's fun to have a goal to work towards, you know what I mean? Because otherwise it's like, why am I even doing this? Well, it's also, it's a, it's a good kind of barometer for your own motivation and the hobby's longevity. Yeah, absolutely. Like once, if you get there and you are still interested, you know that it's a good investment at this point. Yeah, I would say it is. I mean, yeah. I've definitely, I've definitely gotten a lot of good use out of my current saxophone, even if I don't, I mean, I'm, I don't know that I'm going to continue to play it every day at this level for eternity Based on my previous hobby habits, probably not. You know, it's going to ebb and flow just like most other things. But, um, you know, it's still novel enough where I'm practicing it regularly. But, you know, I don't know. I could, whatever, play it in church or some other band or, you know, whatever. Some dad garage band type thing playing Huey Lewis, Huey Lewis songs or something. Or who knows? Bruce at Springsteen. Some, <laughs> at some point, you're going to need to bring it in here. Oh, for sure. Into this room. Well, I'm definitely going to be using it for my Halloween costume. Like, I'm either going to do, like, Bill Clinton or probably uh, Duke Silver is my contender. Duke Silver. Or you do, you could be the Too Many Zoos guy. If I have the berry at that point, you can do you wear those could. big old sneakers and tight, tight, tight would, jeans and do that little, like, like. Do the twirly Yeah, things. do the twirly. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if enough people would know. Well, yeah, probably not. Duke Silver would be more recognized. Duke Silver would be excellent. Yeah. We'll see. And that would be an easy costume. I would just need a fedora. I don't own a fedora. I'm not a hat guy. I don't own a lot of hats. Now, I will say, not to be one of those guys, but Duke Silver wears a trilby. Oh. Indiana Jones has a fedora. What is the difference? Larger bill, or larger brim. 
larger brim yeah. on which? Which has the larger brim? The fedora? The fedora has a larger brim. Yeah. A trill. Trilby. Trilby. Yep. Never heard that word in my life. Yeah. A lot of people call them fedoras. Okay. It's okay. Trilby. Well, now I don't know. Yeah. Because I got to go find one. Only, so. a, only a really pretentious nerd would ever correct mm. you on that. Well, to go pretentious nerd on the musical side, Duke Silver technically has a silver colored saxophone. <gasps> Mine is oh, a gold no. lacquer. Oh. So I didn't know he had a silver one. That's why he's Duke Silver. Oh, it's got a silver sax. I didn't even think about that. I don't know if that's technically the reason why, oh. but I I noticed that immediately when I saw the show. I was like, oh, he's got a silver saxophone. Wow. Which do exist, but they're more expensive, and I couldn't justify that. Mm. I mean, I think silver saxophones look amazing. Yeah. There's some cool colors now they have. They have some like crazy lacquers and some crazy finishes you can get on saxophones these days. Have you seen any used that were silver? Any that, used ones? That that were so used ones are a gamble because oh. you know people you know there could be bent keys, mm. the pads could be dried out. Like pretty much, you assume if you buy a used saxophone, you're gonna have to get it repaired. So, so like with like, the cost of like with the savings of getting it used and getting it refurbished, like would that be it's more po- expensive? It's than- possible. It's possible. But a gamble because you don't know what needs to be refurbished. Yeah. Ah. It's definitely not a sure bet that, you know, it's not like buying a video game cartridge where you're like, what? Well, it either works or it doesn't. Yeah. You know? And it's like, there's a there's a lot of parts and pieces to a saxophone. Um, and it's, you know, if somebody wasn't handling it well, you could be in for yeah. some, some repairs. But, you know, we'll see. There's people that repair them. So that could be feasible. I don't know. I'm still, still looking. Barry saxophones, no, not so much. They're hard to find. Because they're, I can't even find a new one. I can't even find one to get my hands on to just even hold in this entire city. No one stocks them. You got a special order. So, yeah, it's been kind of crazy to find one. Huh. That's what I should have done when I was in the D.C. area. See if any music stores up there have them. But I don't know. It's crazy that they're that hard to come by. But Hmm. anyway. Um, So, yeah, that was a fun visit. Um, Let's see here. What else did we do? Uh, So I alluded to SnowRunner. Um, yes. So I mentioned how I like, I do not play video games. Uh, but my son saved up and we, we split the cost of a Steam Deck together. He mowed the lawn a whole bunch of times and did all kinds of random chores and all that. And and I went half and half with him on a, on a Steam Deck. But he had been putting 99.9% of the Steam Deck hours on it, <laughs> not me. I basically like set it up and then I put in card information when he wants to buy some DLC for trail makers or whatever. Um, but I finally found a game that's got me playing it and it's snow runner and it's such a Brian game. Is this different than the mud runner? It's the follow up to that one. Okay. So it's like same a newer concept version. though. You're just kind of oh, like... exact same concept, okay. but it's a newer game. So it's got better graphics and you know, ah. more capabilities and stuff like that. So no, still using big get, trucks and hauling get, logs. Do and, you get, is there more solutions to getting stuck? Cause I know that was a problem that kind of slowed you down a bit. So this is my, this has been my journey with this game. Um, it's very realistic. Yeah. In which like, Everything you try to do is a slog. But like you, you've kind of you've you've given up. Like once you got stuck, it kind of like it takes a lot of the wind out of your sails. Well, so I still haven't come. I still haven't gone back and played Mud Runner because <laughs> you're still stuck. <laughs> oh, once I drove like 20 minutes in one direction, and then at the very end, my like trailer fell off and I lost my cargo. I was you like, you told me that. Yeah, you, that. you yeah. said you stopped. So you still haven't revisited that. Not that game, but it's oh. like very similar to Snow Runner. Oh, I'll pick it up again. But like, so I picked up Snow Runner, and it was the same kind of same kind of thing. But the graphics are a little better and stuff like that. So I was like, okay. But I did that and it was like every everything I tried to do, I was like, oh, I'll go this direction. I'd look at the map and be like, oh, there's a trail over there. Then you get there and you're like, oh, that mud's really deep and now I'm stuck and there's nothing to winch to. So now I have to go to another vehicle and drive it over and pull it out of the mud and I have to go find another route somewhere. It's like literally every step of everything I tried to do, I had some kind of roadblock and had to come up with a creative solution, which can be very frustrating if you're thinking about it in terms of like, oh, I need to like accomplish the things and get to the goals and beat the game. It's not that kind of game. It is very much like a, oh, I'm stuck. Okay, I'll just go get the other truck. It's been five minutes driving it down to the other thing and I gotta watch out because there's that mud hole there. So I gotta kind of drive it up on the side. Yeah, you a know, lot of patience. It's, it's, it's very much a test of patience kind of game. But in a way, it's kind of like, okay, I just have to be in a different frame of mind when playing a game like that. Whereas, like, I don't have an ex, a, a new Xbox, but my brother-in-law got one for Christmas. And he has Forza Horizon 5, which is 
an unbelievable game. And that game is like the total opposite. You're just, you can drive crazy fast with amazing cars through, you can drive through anything. And I'm like, this is, it just contrasting the two games. So very different. Um, but I was like, wow, this is literally what it's like to be like out there working in my woods and getting stuck in the mud. And then you got to go get the winch and now the winch battery's dead. So guess I got to go find something else and go bring it over there. You know, it's like, it's that kind of game where you're just like, I know what I need to do, but oh, that didn't work. So the let me winch go find has the a thing. battery in the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or your, your car, your trucks have fuel. So you're like, oh, I just need to get from here to there. Oh, it's really muddy and it uses more fuel. So I actually don't have enough fuel to get there now. So now I got to go find another vehicle and drive it over and then <sighs> transport the fuel. <laughs> But it's okay. I'm learning the landscape. And the, but what's crazy? So like this game, I haven't played a modern video game other than like Nintendo games since I think Grand Theft Auto V was the last game, which is a decade old now. That was like the most modern game I'd had. Just the scope and scale of games now blows my mind. Like I was looking at the map for this thing. It starts out in Michigan. You're just like some you know, rural, super muddy town that was flooded or something and just everything's in distress. So you're trying to truck your way through this thing. And I looked at it and there's this map and there's all these different missions and stuff. And I'm like, God, this is gonna take forever. And I was like, how many different like locations are there? There's 41 locations in this game. I'm like, good Lord. I'm like, I could spend like hundreds, if not thousands of hours playing this game. I was like, that's crazy. So anyway, I did a whole bunch of stuff. I have never in my life bought like an add-on like DLC to a video game to try to progress faster, mostly because I'm cheap. Until but now? I finally got to the point where it's like, I think Rachel just got sick of hearing my comments because I'd be playing the game. I'd be like, God, I can, <laughs> you know, just like I was cursing and she's like the running joke now. She'll be like, is that game fun? And I'd just be like, I like wouldn't have a response. It's like, it's an experience. I'm enjoying the experience, but I, it's, it's hard to say that it's fun because it's like a constant just overcoming frustration, but it's still compelling enough to play. I don't know. It's kind of like when I was learning how to solve Rubik's Cube puzzles. It's like, it's fun once you figure it out, but the process is a bit arduous. You seem to be a little attracted to that sort of hobby. I have a little bit of a I don't enjoy the pain. I'm not like a masochist. I enjoy I enjoy the challenge. Yeah. And I like learning and overcoming some of that kind of stuff. So as long as I feel like I'm learning and there's something that it's I'm making some progress. Yeah. I can be very patient yeah. about how slow that progress comes about. And persistent. Yes. I'm very stubborn as well. But I reached a point with this game where I was like, okay, it's starting to not be fun to just like literally everything I'm trying to do, I hit roadblocks and it's, I'm, I'm having to do it. So I, I went and I bought a truck, one truck that's like a pretty One truck to rule them all. Truck. It's like an eight wheeled gigantic vehicle and I can haul all kinds of stuff. And I was like, okay. This helps. It's still a slog. Yeah. But now I'm sure you can like, still get stuck. Yeah. It went from unbearable to now arduous. Okay. <laughs> so it's still an arduous game, but at least like I can complete a mission in a reasonable amount of time. You know, it might take me 25 minutes instead of an hour and 15 minutes. You know, like some of it was really taking that long. Jeez. Like I just need to get this vehicle up this hill, but it's like just trying to get it up there and you're winching. And it's just like, ah, oh, so many things. Has anyway. Joseph tried this game? No, he has no interest in it. This is not a game that anyone else in my family would tolerate. This is purely a Brian thing. And I think I can only tolerate it because I've done this stuff in real life and it's even worse in real life. So I'm like, oh, it's like so easy. I just hit one button and the winch is hooked up. Normally that would be like a two hour thing for me to physically go in the cold with the mud and bugs and all the whatever and to hook up a winch. And then like, would that even work? Maybe not. So it's like, I know that it's so much worse in real life. So it's more fun because I'm like, oh, this is, this is a lot easier. I'm just sitting comfy in my couch and getting to, to get this experience. So I am actually having a lot of fun playing this game, but it's also like, because I had the downtime and I was off last week, that's why I had the fun. And now that I'm like back in reality and there's dishes and there's laundry and all these things and projects around the house and work and all that, I'm like, yeah, I don't know when the next time I'm gonna get to play this game will be, but you know, 
it's there for me when I'm when I need it. But I'm having fun. And now I fully understand when I sat next to that guy on the plane that I mentioned previously, uh, when I was on my trip going to New Orleans, I sat next to a guy on the plane who had a Steam Deck and was playing SnowRunner. And I was like, hey, is that SnowRunner? And he was like, yeah. I was like, how is that game? Is it fun? I think I asked him, is it fun or are you enjoying it? And he was like, that's exactly what you would think it would be. I understand what he's talking about now, and I think I would have. I'm so surprised response. that like you happen to be sitting next to somebody who happened to have a Steam Deck, Steam deck which I, who I've never seen. I've never seen somebody who use a Steam Deck it's, on a plane. It's the first time I've ever seen one in the wild. And I've also like the fact that he was playing that game. That game of the all the very game that I was interested in of all the computer games out there. Yeah, isn't that crazy? It was wild. meant to be. And the fact that he described it in a way that was entirely accurate as to what it has been as my experience I can't now. Can't believe it. So anyway. It's been, it's actually been fun, but anyway, um, that's enough about that. Let's see here. What else? Yard work. You want a yard work update? Because that's, this is where my life is right now. <laughs> Cause now it's springtime. There's a nice coating of yellow pollen on everything. It's like blowing in the wind. Everything today was so bad. There's literally like yellow footprints on the carpet in the entrance in our building, because as we're all walking in the parking lot, we're picking up so much pollen that it's leaving footprints in our in our building. Back decks are slippery. Oh yeah, with dust. It's crazy. I have wrecked my bike twice in my driveway because the pollen builds up, and then when it rains, it creates like a slick. So I have to like power wash my driveway <laughs> because of the pollen, just so I don't hurt myself. Anyway, um, so that's the thing. Yes, plenty of that. Um, lots of yard work, lime, fertilizer, seed. I've never fertilized my lawn before. Right. I bought like a pH, you know, in nutrient meter of some kind. I don't know. I I, I only want to learn but so much about the yard stuff and we'll see. But um, yeah, so I, I think I talked about this before, but I was like, let me try some fertilizer, see what it does. Just a, just a bit. Um, so I'm trying that. We'll see how that does. Lots of seeding, weeding, all the stuff. Um, Joseph is mowing. Got him going on that. Um, got the log grave all smoothed over. Feels like it's stable enough for what it is. You gonna put some a memorial um, garden on top of it? Well, I'm just gonna plant grass over top of it. But I, you know, smoothed it all out, put down some fertilizer, did some grass seed, put the hay over top of it, which I was really happy because I had leftover hay bales from last year and I just tarped it and just left it up all winter. And I, I was you, like, 2024 is who knows the, what, who knows what this is going to look like next year. This is, this is your year. The 2024 is the year of Brian's hoarding being justified. I really is. I feel like every week we discover a new thing where you're like, Hey, I, I hey, used that thing I that, that I kept. Thing and now yeah. I've used it. Yep. That $8 bale of hay got some use out of it now. And it's, it's there. So, yep. And then, um, mulch is the next thing on my mind because I did not mulch at all last year and now it's looking, Same. looking pretty rough. Same. Yeah. Yeah. Last year was the only year since I bought my house that I did not mulch the, uh, you know, around the house. Yeah. But yeah. A- apart from you, I only need about 15 bags. You yeah, probably need, you need a truck. I don't buy it by bags. I yeah. buy it by cubic yards. Yeah. Which I need about 20 cubic yards of mulch. I have to have bags like because I don't, truck. Yeah. I refuse to buy a wheelbarrow. So. Oh man. I'm bag only. You don't need a wheelbarrow. You need a, a, garden cart that is the way to go it's got four wheels you don't have to lift anything oh. you just pull it like a it's amazing mm. it's amazing i will i have a wheelbarrow that i never use because the garden cart is the way to go Dang, okay. gorilla cart is a really good one to look at if you're interested i'm just not, about everything about these types of tools but I, I have to draw a line or else i'm going to accumulate things i don't want to accumulate it's true. it does take up space i yeah, will say that i can't um, um, let's see. What else am I doing? Da, 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 da. Yeah, so I'll be mulching probably this weekend. I need to call and get it delivered, but that'll be a thing. Mm. Um, let's see here. Blah, 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 blah. What else? Oh, my dad uh, had his 70th birthday. Hey! So that's kind of a milestone. He didn't want to make like a big deal about it, but we hung out with him. It was cool. Good time had by all. And yeah, 40 is right around the corner for me, which I know you've experienced. You've survived it. And uh, I'll be hitting it in a couple of weeks here. So... I don't know. I don't really care that much about birthdays, but this one is like more present on my mind. Yeah, it was. It's been. It's been weird. Yeah, it's been. It's been feel different. Yeah, oh sure. Because physically, because no, you just time has passed, but you reflect a little bit more. Yeah, on things that kind of lead you, you know, into some potentially depressing territory, (laughs) depending on where you're at and Mm. where your brain chooses to go. Mm. Mostly, it's been positive and fulfilling, but you know there are. There's the, you know, 
the mortality thoughts that mm. creep in. Yeah. But, you know, honestly, that could happen at any point. Yeah, like your heart starts racing and you're like, oh, I hope this isn't a problem now. Maybe I should get that checked out because, like, I'm well, reaching the age where these, it, it these really, things start to get concerning. <laughs> time just seems to be moving faster, and oh, yeah. that's a little terrifying. Yes. And then, then you know that, like, it just gets exponentially faster after this point. Yes. You know, from, you know, talking to family members and friends and. Yeah. You know. Well, I mean, each, each day that passes now is a smaller portion of your life as a whole. So it's going to relatively, it's going to seem not as significant. Yep. So yes, we are in the same boat on that one. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it should be fun. I literally have nothing planned. I don't know that we're going to do a thing. I'm not a big birthday guy. Neither like, am I, yeah. which is why Shannon, you know, said mountain cabin, just the three of us. Yeah. You know, that was much more my speed. I did not have mm. a party. You know, yeah. my grandmother got me a carrot cake, which is, you know, what I wanted. But okay. that was just with me and a couple, you know, our little tiny family. So, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah but uh, yeah. I think it's worth doing something for yourself, depending on what you like. Yeah. Well, Rachel and I are going to like a Creed concert later on. That was sort of our joint gifts to each other. There you go. But that's like, that's just a me and her thing. Yeah. You know, Do you have a favorite restaurant? Yeah, might do that. Yeah, I'll probably do something just like something. low key. Yeah. yeah, play some Snow Runner. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Anyway, um, cool. That's it. Uh, that's ever what's happening. And I got a fun fact. Oh. oh boy, do I got a fun fact. Oh boy. So uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this thing up. Well, thank you all for watching. Please leave us some feedback. Let us know how we're doing. Ask us questions. Uh, if you want to know about some pen stuff, you can go check out GooliPens.com. For fountain pen, ink, and paper needs, like, subscribe, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, all those places. Okay, so I got a fun fact. I would love to hear it. Of course, I like to watch all kinds of random stuff on YouTube. <gasps> I look like a manic yes. person in my YouTube history. Go on. I love, like, science-y kind of stuff, so I watch a lot of that. Space things. There's a lot of space stuff going on with the um, eclipse and all that kind there of stuff. Is, yeah. So a lot of that was in my feed, and I watched a lot of it. Um, so I... I Learn something new. This is complicated. I was excited about it. And I talked about it with Rachel and she was like, challenged me and was confused and then disinterested. So I, know I don't that's know. Like. I don't know how this is going to take, but I will try. So forgive me, especially those of you who know more about this stuff. But it was just something new I hadn't heard about before that was kind of compelling. Um, so um, I was just watching a random video about like 50 random science facts you don't know. Well, as you. <laughs> that was a very quiet sneeze. TCB. I am incapable of sneezing. Oh, I know. Quiet. Have I ever sneezed on the Pencast? I don't think I have. I don't think so. I think y'all would know if it happened. My sneezes are violent. Well, they would. we would need to cut the They're audio completely violent. out. It would spike the, yeah. the audio for sure. Yeah. It's very violent. Yes. I would sneeze like when Joseph was a baby. He would be in the other room and I would sneeze and it would wake him up and he would cry. That's how loud my sneezes are. It sounds like a shotgun going off. Uh, I can't help it. It's just that loud. Anyway, I digress. That's not the point of the random fact today. Um, okay, so um, a lot of people were looking up in the sky, right? Sun, moon, cool. There's a lot of other stuff going on too, right? So, um, you know, with all these telescopes and stuff, we've been able to look at a lot of things. <laughs> get, you know, at least somewhat of a basic understanding about like the size of our universe and so on. Um, so um, scientists have measured that the, the current observable universe, you know, what we can possibly see, extends, you know, about 46.1 billion light years in all directions. It's very, very large. Yes. So for those of you who don't know a light year is how, fa how fast light travels or how far light travels in one Earth year. Um, so it's like the measurement there. Um, and it's the, f it's the light is the fastest thing that we know of in our universe. And nothing can go faster than that. Um, uh, and also, so the universe, 46.1 billion light years. That's older than the, or that's, sorry, that's, that's what they think it's like 13.8 billion years old or estimated as the age of our universe. So very large, like starting, you, you could not travel even at the speed of light, the distance of the universe because you would have to have been older than the universe is already. Um, but what's crazy is that the universe is expanding, constantly expanding at a very rapid rate, and I believe at an increasing rate, if I'm not mistaken. I think that was a recent discovery. Yeah. I think that they recently discovered that it was... So it wasn't like an explosion, and then as it's 
as it's dissipated, it's slowing down. It's actually speeding up yeah. for some reason. They yeah. don't really know why. Um, so I learned about a new term called the cosmological event horizon. So if you're familiar with black holes at all as a concept, you know that the event horizon is the point at which nothing can escape the gravitational pull of that black hole. That's why it's a black hole. So light can't even escape it. So the very, very point, that very edge is called the event horizon because we are incapable of observing anything that happens beyond that point because- Without getting sucked into it. Right. But like we can never be on the outside looking in and see anything there yeah. because nothing can escape its pull. That's called the event horizon. Um, so there is something called the cosmological event horizon. And I'm going to try to explain this, but I barely understand it. I got really excited about it, but then we'll see if I can explain it well enough. Um, so uh, the cosmological event horizon defines a limit on what we on Earth will ever be able to observe in the universe due to the expansion, the future expansion of the universe and the distance that light would have to travel in order to reach us. So for example, right now, when we're looking up at the sky, even with the telescopes and stuff, it's almost like we're time traveling because mm -hmm. we're not seeing what's happening now. We're seeing what happened based on the distance that light had to travel to us. So if we're looking at a galaxy that's 100 million light years away, we're looking at what it looked like 100 million years ago because now it looks different. It's just the light hasn't traveled to us yet, right? So that gets really trippy. And that's why I like things like the JWST telescope are so mind blowing because we're essentially able to look back in time, looking at stuff that's further and further away. We can see things that are 13 billion years old. So Does that mean see... that with that invention of the telescope, our cosmological event horizon had increased? So here's the thing. Mm. Here's the thing. There, no. Oh. So we're able to observe more, but the limit of it is based on the speed of light mm -hmm. because that's the fastest anything can go in the universe. So because the universe is constantly expanding, the light and stuff that's traveled from galaxies that are really far away, that was stuff that happened maybe 13 billion years ago, but we were a lot closer to that stuff 13 billion years ago. So the stuff that's happening now in those places, because the universe is expanding, the light that's traveling there will never be able to reach us. Oh, okay, yeah. So the cosmological event horizon is a, a distance that things are from us where because we're expanding, everything's expanding away from everything else, we essentially are only ever going to be able to view because of the limitations of the speed of light. We will, even with the strongest telescopes or whatever, we will only ever be able to view within a certain distance of earth mm -hmm. because it's literally so vast. The universe is so vast and expanding that light will never reach us. Hmm. Isn't that crazy to think about? Yeah, I guess I've never really thought about like where it's expanding. In my mind, there's always it's been expanding like- expanding in all directions. Yeah, so, so that, yeah. That, that's the thing, it's like, if, well, I, I've always pictured like it expanding kind of like if you like click and drag something in Photoshop, like you're dragging the outside rim of something, yeah. but it's really- It's three dimensional though. Right, you it's, know? it's really everything in between is expanding. Right. So if you think of it that way, then yeah. the event horizon makes sense yeah. because even things in the middle of the expansion are still drawing farther away from each other. Yes. So that's actually, I mean, it makes sense when you think about it, but yeah. pr prior to now, I've always just kind of pictured the edge expanding, like moving into- Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like, you know, you've seen like the old maps, like, oh no, this is where the nuclear explosion is going to be. And you see the map like spreading out. Right. That's kind of how I've always pictured it. Right. Not the distance of the middle things moving apart from each other as yes, well. Exactly. So once and, you understand that, then. And it's not like that totally, totally calculated, but especially because if you think about like whatever, there's a middle point at some point. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. I don't know how much they've proven it. You know, this is where like Big Bang Theory comes in and stuff like that, but they believe that everything originated from a point. Sort of like when you have a bomb, it's like there is the bomb, it goes off, yeah. things explode in all directions. That's sort of, I guess, mm -hmm. like how the universe they, they believe has, has happened. Um, I'm not trying to get into a debate about the origins of the universe. Well, even that they're saying it's now that be, now they're saying like yeah, that was like, just one of the big bangs. Like they're, they're saying that yeah, there was probably multiple. Before. JWST is like blowing all kinds of theories it's out really of the water. Cool. It's crazy, but um, you know, I'm not trying to go that deep on it. Even though we're already way deep in on this. Oh yeah, this is where I like I already lost Rachel a long time ago on this. She just couldn't. 
Um, this is also late last night. But anyway, so um, yeah, the universe, like I mentioned, is expanding at a rapid rate. So actually, the especially like when you think about it's expanding in, in all directions. So us, so say we're on one side of the rate of origin of it. Something else is on the other side. We're expanding in different directions. So we're actually expanding it faster than the speed of light. Mm. Well, there you go. You know, so like that's how fast things are exploding. So that's why things that are happening at a certain distance away, even the speed of light will never reach us because everything's going off in different directions. Yeah. So that's this whole thing. The cosmological event horizon is essentially this bubble around Earth that will we are physically do the laws of physics are incapable of ever seeing outside of this bubble. Mm -hmm. um, so just to give some perspective, it's still a very large bubble, but the current observable universe, they believe it extends 14 or sorry, 46.1 billion light years in all directions. So it's very, very big. I guess if you double that, you know, that's the, the overall size is like 90 billion light years. Um, the cosmological event horizon is between 16 and 17 billion light years away from earth. So they've, they've, estimated that at this point 86 ish percent of the universe we will physically never be able to observe because everything is spreading out so much that even at the speed of light it'll never reach us. until we learn how to fold space time that would be the hack obviously like find a wormhole or bend yeah. space time which is where you get in this science Gotta fiction punch type a hole stuff. through the paper yeah, so just think about like as much as it's like totally mind blowing to look up at the stars and like be able to measure all the stuff with, and it doesn't matter how powerful the telescope would be, literally the light would never reach us yeah. for 86% of the universe that's out there. That's, it's so mind blowingly vast. Yes. It's just fascinating. So yeah, that's my fun fact. The cosmo I'd never heard of the cosmological event horizon and it kind of blew my mind, so. I didn't know about that, that either. Thing. There you yeah. go. That's Fun officially facts. mind melting. Fine. Yeah, right? There you go. Take that at the end of a pen cast. Um, anyway, hope you all enjoyed this. We um, might have broken a record on this one. Did we? Depending on what how long oh Ian's gosh. video oh, is. Oh, you're right. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm back, folks. Um, <laughs> anyway, hope you all enjoyed this. Making up for lost time, even though we still did it last week with Janae. So, I don't know. It was like an hour and 48 minutes. Oh, Lord. Yeah. I got a problem. It's okay. I know too much. <laughs> it's okay. We're making up for lost like time. I got to get my breath control in. There we go. Absolutely. Anyway, <laughs> hope you all enjoy it. We'll see you next week and right on. <laughs>